what happened to John O'Keefe. And me and my family and my attorneys and my team have marshaled every resource to get to the truth. It just feels like no one else wants it. And Karen, just to be clear, you didn't do it. We know who did it, Steve. We know. And we know who spearheaded this cover-up. You all know. Yes, we do. And no, she didn't do it. No, she didn't do it. This is an innocent woman. She didn't do it. I tried to save his life. Yeah. I tried to save his life at 6 in the morning. I was covered in his blood. I was the only one trying to save his life. Why'd you admit to it? He didn't, she didn't admit to it. She didn't admit to anything close to that. Nothing close to that. And you should know that. Sounds like three or four times she admitted to it. No, no, she didn't. No, that's not true. She asked a question. It makes absolutely no sense. That is the Commonwealth grasping at straws. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. We have the eight letters. We've seen them. We've read them. We are using them. The genie cannot be put back in the bottle. Yeah, LTL true crime. We going deep in the dark. Yeah, yeah peeling back the layers, expose the hidden mark. Oh, yeah. From the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie. Get in into minds of the wicked, no alibi. LTL true crime unraveling the web of evil No stone left unturned, we diving to the prime Yeah, we digging up the dirt, bringing justice to the crime LTL true crime unveiling dark realities every time Yeah, LTL true crime, we going deep in the dark yeah. Peeling back the layers, exposed to him more from the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie Get it fixed in mind, something wicked, no alibi <laughs> 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 I pick the true crime Who go with dark realities every time All right, let's start over. Welcome, everybody, to LTL True Crime. It is Wednesday, March 13, 2024. It is a hump day, and uh, it's been a very interesting, let's say, 36 hours. Very interesting 36 hours. And, uh, of course, uh, with all the things that have gone on here in the Karen Reed case, uh, I, it's... I. I didn't, you know, I knew this was going to happen. We knew this was going to happen. We knew the truth would start coming out, and it finally is. The feds are on to it. I don't know how this can, can continue. Uh, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. I don't know how this continue, but uh, we're going to get into the heart of the show tonight here. Uh, I'm a little thrown off because my mic was muted. I apologize, um, but I'm a little thrown off right now, but I'll get back on my game. 
But before we get into some breaking news that happened today, I do want to pull this up because this was a story that I was reading just before I came on air. And um, I was a bit taken back uh, by this story. Um, and if anybody out there, if they follow the UFC, um, I want to just bring this to an uh, to your all attention. I don't know if you know who Mark Coleman, Coleman is, but I used to follow the UFC way back when it first started. I think back in 94 or 95 when they did their first uh, broadcast. And it could have been a little bit earlier than that. But Mark Coleman was the actual, the first UFC heavyweight champion, crowned the first UFC heavyweight champion. And um, he uh, unfortunately had a very uh, life-threatening accident uh, that happened uh, today. And it said, Justin, UFC legend Mark Coleman is fighting for his life after he saved his parents from a house fire in Ohio. Coleman, who was the first UFC heavyweight champion, single-handedly carried both of his parents out of the house and went back for the family dog. Uh, Coleman was then life flighted to the hospital where he is now battling for his life, according to family members. As many of you know, our dad was involved in a house fire early this morning, along with his parents and beloved dog, Hammer an IG post read. He managed to carry out both of his parents out of the house, but despite his efforts, was not able to save Hammer. Uh, he's in life. He, he was life flighted to a hospital where he's currently battling for his life uh, after this heroic act. And it just brings, I, I got very emotional. It brought tears to my eyes. You can see Mark there um, in uh, the hospital, uh, his hospital bed there. And I just want to wish uh, Mark uh, many, many, many prayers. And that right there is a is a true hero, an absolute true hero. And I hope Mark can pull through this. Uh, he was one of the good guys in the UFC and just an absolute legend, absolute legend uh, in his time. And for someone to do what he did to save his parents, again, uh, absolute true hero. So if you all can send some prayers out to Mark Coleman, uh, we are pulling for you here on LTL. and. Um, I really hope that he can pull out of this. I really do. So um, we'll we'll move on here. Okay. Breaking news. Breaking news. Oh boy. I left work today at six o'clock and my phone must I, I must have gotten oh a 10 to 15 text messages, media messages, social media. Everybody sending me the article. Everybody's everybody sending me the article. So uh, Ted Daniels uh, of uh, Boston 25 reports Massachusetts State Police investigation uh, investigating a detective in the Karen Reed case. And we will play this here, uh, this video in a second, but I want to read a little bit of the article. So Dedham Mass, the Massachusetts State Police Internal Affairs Units, is investigating a state police detective for a potential violation of the department's policy in connection with the Karen Reed case. Uh, 25 investiga uh, investigates learned of the internal affairs investigation Wednesday, one day after the hearing for Karen Reed, the woman accused uh, in the death of her boyfriend, Boston Police Officer John O'Keefe. Uh, her defense argued that Detective Michael Proctor was not truthful with his relationship with the people uh, that he identified as witnesses in the case. According to defense, Proctor admitted, uh, admitted this to the federal grand jury. The defense also says text messages analyzing uh, in the analyzed in the federal investigation revealed that one uh, of the other witnesses offered to buy Proctor a gift when the case against Reed was over. Proctor is le uh, the lead investigator in the Reed case. State police tell 25 investigates that Trooper Proctor remains on full active duty amid the investigation, which I think is bullshit. He should be sitting on the sidelines and not being paid. Uh, on Wednesday, Reed's lawyers filed a request for information from the state police internal affair unit. The substance of that request is unknown because the defense was asked uh, it to be sealed by the court. Uh, this developing story, check back for updates. So there you go. Federal probe finding reveals in, uh, in court, Karen Reed's defense team pushes to dismiss the murder case. Uh, let me see here if I got the video. Here we go. We'll play this video here. We got a commercial, of course. Commercials. Oh, boy. I just love it. These websites are terrible. Uh, 
don't even know if anybody can see this. All right, let's get some sound. Trooper Michael Proctor. Let's go back. 25 investigates with breaking news in the Karen Reed murder investigation. Investigative reporter Ted Daniel joining us now live. Ted, you've now learned the state police detective is now being investigated himself. Mark and Vanessa, we just got this confirmed by the Massachusetts State Police. They say they have opened an internal investigation into a potential violation of department policy by Trooper Michael Proctor. Proctor is the you lead my investigator mind. on the Reed case. He remains on full duty, according to the state police. Yeah. This comes one day after a hearing where lawyers for Karen Reed said that Proctor was not truthful about his relationship with people the Norfolk DA's office has identified as witnesses in the Karen Reed case. The defense says Proctor admitted this to a federal grand jury. According to the defense, Proctor was also offered a gift from a family member of a witness. Today, Reed's yep. defense team filed a request for information from the state police internal affairs unit. That request is impounded, so we don't know exactly what they're looking for. I'll continue to work my sources on this and bring you any new updates. Vanessa? Interesting update there, Ted, and you know so many people, so many of our viewers are very interested in this case, and we know you'll keep tracking down new information. Thank you, Ted. You know, in, in you know, just reflecting on the chat here, what everybody said, you know, uh, this is going to spoil a lot for the Walsh case if this goes down. I mean, it's going to still just shed even a negative light on anything that Proctor has been the lead investigator in now, but we know that the Walsh case is almost simultaneously running along with the Karen Reed case. And who was the lead detective in the Walsh case? Proctor uh, talked a lot about Google searches, uh, locations of phone, uh, cell information. Uh, they found all of that in the Walsh case. Now, I got to say, <laughs> it doesn't really look too good for Walsh. I mean, all that evidence is pretty much adding up against him. But this is really going to screw that case up. I mean, you could potentially have a, a person that brutally murdered his wife walk uh, and then go back to you know, all the cases that Proctor was a lead investigator in, uh, does this now cause issues with that? You might see people, if he, you know, Proctor gets convicted of everything, I'm going to tell you, I mean, a lot of lawsuits being uh, filed here and, and cases looked back into and potentially people walking that should be behind jail, but but also letting people that are behind bars right now uh, walk that shouldn't be behind there. So uh, it's, it's very interesting and it's, uh, it's not good. It's not good. And, um, you know, what, what I was talking about earlier was, you know, the bottom line is this, all we want to know is what happened to John. That's it. And everybody, you know, just in the court hearing yesterday, I mean, I don't know how people can keep going on with this, that Karen Reed is guilty. Karen Reed is, I mean, you literally had federal, uh, federal employees or federal agents testify, uh, in the grand jury and basically said that this did not happen. You had an expert that was hired by the FBI with three different uh, PhDs in the area of accident reconstruction and went through the motions and did the experiments. And the conclusion of that report was John O'Keefe's injuries did not happen by Karen Reed's SUV, nor did it happen by an SUV. Where does that default to? 34 Fairview. So we know it's now confirmed. It's now confirmed. And like we've said all along, it is confirmed that it happened inside that house. We just want to know what happened. Did John walk in and he was mouthy and a fight broke out right away? Or was this something that was planned? Or were they in there for a few minutes and then, you know, something broke out? That, that's all we want to know. And then why not stop? Why keep going? You know, if it was an accident, why? frame job it and make make it look like Karen killed him. So that's all we want to know. You know, and I hope that we do get that truth because not only does it bring justice to John's family and you know everybody here that's been following this, but maybe, you know, and and obviously give some peace to his family and the real truth because we know how they stand in this case. I mean, it's almost Im impossible that you could sit there and I mean, wouldn't you not want Karen accused of this uh, in saying that she did it? I mean, Karen was with John. 
I mean, why why would you want to say that Karen did this? It's just very odd. It's a very weird relationship on how the uh, the O'Keefe stand with this. Uh, I don't know. I just find it very odd. But we just want to know. We just want to know what happened. And and obviously, as the days go on in these court hearings and more filings come out and more evidence comes out, we're starting to fully learn the truth of what happened. Um, you know, it's it's pretty obvious. And I don't know how the trolls and coffin daffer can keep going on with this, you know, saying that, uh, well, because the defense said it, uh, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily true. Like, I want to be like, yo, your own department that you were with for whatever, 20 years, the FBI, the organization that you served with literally said that Karen Reed didn't do this. Like, I don't know what else you need. Like, do you need them to write it down for you? I mean, I, I don't get it. And, uh, you know, I, I found uh, most of the trolls were pretty quiet yesterday after the court uh, court hearing, but uh, completely just went on and said, oh, this is all fabricated. It's just part of the defense. I mean, literally, this was testified in front of the grand jury. <laughs> I mean, I don't I don't know how much more you, you need there. But uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I was talking uh, to my dad and I said, uh, I give it three more weeks and this this is over. It's dismissed. I mean, she. I, I think now the, uh, what is it? The yarn is being pulled and it's on full spin right now and it's all starting to come out. So anyway, we're going to go over to Turtle Boy. Uh, his response, he was over on Howie Carr. I have that queued up. Let's listen to TB and hear what he had to say about this. All right, here we go. By the way, there is uh, breaking news tonight on the uh, Karen Reed uh, Turtle Boy front. This is another huge development. This Channel 25 is reporting this. 25 investigators. Oh, I know what I I know what I got that I haven't done in a while. Check this out. Before we break in. Howie had his little break in. I got my little break in. Here we go. I forgot I had that. <laughs> Massachusetts, they just posted it just moments ago, Massachusetts State Police investigating a detective in the Karen Reed case. This is, uh, this is Michael Proctor, the guy who's, who, according to Turtle Boy, said that uh, he had, he's, the, he's the head investigator uh, for the, uh, he's a detective assigned to the Norfolk County DA's office in Quincy. And uh, he's the one who uh, led the investigation. And he claimed he had no connections to the uh, to the McAlberts, as they call them, the the, the Canton townies, that uh, that that John <laughs> O'Keefe, the dead Boston police officer, was drinking with that night. And apparently, he's he's in like Flynn with them, and they got text messages. The feds have text messages with him back and forth with the family that uh, that that had this, these dealings with John O'Keefe before he ended up dead. <clears throat> And uh, and Proctor uh, Proctor is the one who was in charge of the investigation that said there was a uh, that that the O'Keefe was killed by a uh, by his girlfriend in her SUV. And now the FBI and the feds have said they hired uh, three uh, uh, accident uh, accident investigators outside people. And all of them said that was not possible. So how can they charge Karen Reed with murdering her Seriously. boyfriend with a car if the feds say the murder couldn't have been com committed with a car? Right. But anyway, according to Channel 25, the Massachusetts State Police Internal Affairs Unit is investigating a state police detective for a potential violation of department policy in connection with the Karen Reed murder case. 25 investigates learned of the internal affairs investigation today, one day after a hearing for Karen Reed, the woman accused in the death of her boyfriend, Boston police officer, John O'Keefe. Her defense argued that Detective Michael Proctor was not truthful with his relationship with people he has identified as witnesses in the case. According to the defense, Proctor admitted this to a federal grand jury. He didn't want to get jammed up with the feds. Because, you know, in a federal grand jury, probably most state grand juries, too, they seldom ask you a question unless they already have the answer to it. Because yeah. if you answer improperly, perjury, obstruction of justice, et cetera, et cetera. We'll be right back. I'm Howie Carr.
I can't remember crazier times. Than right, I'm going to oh, skip through here. And we'll get to Aiden. Aiden joined Howie. So, yeah, I mean, he's got a lot of commercials. God bless you, Howie. <laughs> <laughs> got to pay the bills. I get it, Howie. Good for you. Let's go. Yeah, the, the John O'Keefe was not very fast. The Matthews Brothers Studios. The wheels of justice usually grind slowly, and they have in this case uh, with Karen Reed, the, her uh, boyfriend, uh, John O'Keefe, was killed more than two years ago. But now things are moving very fast. The uh, the FBI. Uh... You know, I just got to stop this really quick, just real quick, and, and just I have something on my mind. You know, it's like I look at all the, the people that have called, you know, TB an idiot through all of this, and he's this and he's that. I can't wait. <laughs> Because it's just going to be such a great feeling for TB. I can't wait until this all gets goes down and Karen's case gets dismissed. She walks out a free uh, woman. Uh, Aiden walks out free and literally can just laugh at everybody and said, I told you all that I was right. I told you from the start when I first started reporting this that I was right. And I'll tell you, I know that he's gotten the same criticism in in all of that. I mean, I've gotten the same too. I mean, I've had people attack me uh, and people scream at me and say, I'm crazy and, and you're an idiot and all that stuff too. And I and it's funny, I was, uh, I was talking to uh, my better half uh, before the show and I just said, you know, it's, uh, it's funny because I can't wait to kick this all back in their face and say, no, I told you so because you didn't want to open up your eyes and look at the truth. You know, and, and it, it goes down to uh, one of the people that I used to stream with. I used to have a former detective on my show. I used to have a former police officer on my show. The minute he found that that uh, this possibly could be police corruption, he was like, there's no way in hell that could have happened. And he essentially cursed me up and down, would not do shows with me anymore. And then like one of his shows, he went on to attack. He actually did a couple of shows. He went on because he started his own channel. He went on to attack Turtle Boy and call uh, call him an idiot and I'm an idiot and this and, and this and that. And then another person that I used to stream with too, uh, she went on and tried taking hits at Aiden too. And I can't wait until this goes back because I'm going to throw it all in their face and say we were right the whole time. So uh, I find it, I just find it hilarious. All right, let's play Howie. Uh, documents were introduced, into, not into evidence, but they were brought up publicly yesterday uh, showing that uh, the FBI with uh, – Experts think uh, that she, that John O'Keefe was not killed by a car, and that they're all sort. And that now they uh, they also found all these text messages between Michael Proctor, the state <clears> cop, <throat> who's uh, in charge of the investigation, uh, between some of the McAlberts, the people that uh, that O'Keefe and Karen Reed were partying with that night. And uh, so this afternoon, just now, uh, Channel 25 is reporting Massachusetts State Police, the Internal Affairs Unit, is investigating the detective Proctor. Again, this is Channel 25. And uh, Proctor has admitted to a federal grand jury, according to what was said in publicly in court yesterday, that he uh, he did exchange, he did know the, these, uh, these wit witnesses that he should have been investigating, or he was supposed to be investigating, and that he misled uh, people in the inv in uh, hires up about uh, his relationship. Yeah, he's just trash. He's just a trash person that's very angry at the world. You know, I gave him many, many chances. I gave him a platform. I was super kind to him. Let him come on here. I dropped his channel link a billion times. I knew what happened when he ran away and started his channel. He stole, you know, all of the uh, the people that were in my live chat then. He went over and converted all those people over to his channel and called me a son of a bitch on whatever platform they were all chatting on. He riled up all those people over there and turned all those people against me. Um, and, you know, it, it sucks because I lost a lot of great people that used to watch me because of him. And, um, you know, I gave him a suit. I gave him a crazy platform. And it's not only that he ruined stuff with me. He ruined stuff with T-Rev, too, because he used to stream a lot with T-Rev. And he went on and fucked all that up. And he knew he didn't have a channel to run to. So he came over. He slithered, slithered his way in over here. I allowed him to come on the panel about six times. And he fucked up over here, too. And then he went over and started his own channel, grabbed all those people from my chat, and converted them all against me. And I was the bad guy in all of that? Fuck him. You know what? Dude, 
you look like a moron now. If you even paying attention to this now, you look like a complete fucking asshole. So, all right, we'll play through Howie here. With him. Just and YouTube they, drama one shit. One of the uh, witnesses offered the yeah. by Proctor a gift when the case against Reed was over. This guy is the lead investigator in this, this case. This woman is charged with murder, and the FBI says she couldn't have murdered the guy with uh, her boyfriend with the car because he wasn't killed by a car. On Wednesday, Reed's yeah. lawyers filed a request for information from the state police internal affairs unit. The request uh, of that, the substance of that request is unknown because the defense has asked it be sealed by the court. Joining us now to uh, to talk about this latest uh, development is uh, Aiden Kearney, a.k.a. Turtle Boy. This is a pretty, pretty big story, isn't it, uh, Aiden? Things are moving fast. Yeah, I think it the beginning of the end is coming finally, Howie. You know, one domino falls, they're all going to start falling. Uh, this should have happened a long, long time ago. This has all been out there. The state police know it. Uh, what I'm worried about is that they will just have a fall guy. He'll be the fall guy, and that's it. You know, you remember a few years ago, Leah Genduso, you know, got on there. You know, we, we, I broke that story about her right. being a former drug dealer and getting on. Who was the only person that went down for that? Her. No, Not the people who hired her. Who got right. on there, who looked past all that. Yeah, they all got that. huge pensions. One of them's working for Sean O'Brien now, That the guy that's the head of the Teamsters. It's, yeah, yeah, you're right. She was the right. only one who took a fall. Yeah, so, like, with this, it's like, Michael Proctor, they all knew about Michael Proctor's relationship with the Proctors and uh, with the uh, Alberts and the McCabe's. They all knew. And as much as I want to see Michael Proctor go down, if it's only him going down, then that's an injustice. His bosses, Yuri Buchanan, and Brian Tully, the lieutenant who was charging me with witness intimidation, they were both well aware of it. And what did they do when a journalist started exposing all of this? All of everything I've reported has now been vindicated. And what did they do when I arrested and protested these people? I apologize. When I wrote about and protested these people, they arrested me. They yeah. took the state police fugitive unit to my house to arrest me in front of my kids. And justice is coming for them. Do, do, I asked you last night, do we know who Proctor told, did he, did he tell the state grand jury that he had no relationship to the uh, McAlberts or do, do we know that yet? Yeah. So, uh, well, it's according to what we heard yesterday, he minimized his relationship with the, uh, with the Alberts and the McCabe's, um, I I guess in front of the, the, the state grand jury, that'd be the only place he would have. Been able right, to admit, been and so then the up. feds, but with case, with the feds brought him in to Moakley Court to the Moakley Courthouse, they they already had the the uh, the text messages, so they so he knew and he knew he was jammed up if he if he lied, so he right. told the truth. Right, right, and in my case, you know, we've seen that Lieutenant Tully was asked specifically uh, at a grand jury about whether or not Michael Proctor had a relationship with the Alberts. And he specifically no. said no. And guess he lied, what? And that's why I ended up getting indicted because these people yeah. lied. It's not just Proctor covering things up. It's Buchanan. It's Tully, that's the state. It's that's Fanning, the state grand jury he yep. lied to. You're saying, Tully? Yeah, yeah, exactly. In my case. And how do you how do you know you weren't there? How do how do you know he lied to the to the grand jury? Because that's what the this is all documented. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So listen to this. State police tell 25 investigates that Trooper Proctor remains on full active duty yeah, amid the investigation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty idea. funny, isn't it? I mean, can you imagine that, he, you know, all the cases he's involved in, if this is all true, they're all going to be thrown out. Yeah, Every pending case, they're going to be appeals on all the ones he got yep. convictions on. Like they're not, I don't believe they're going to let him contaminate any more cases if uh, if if this is all uh going to pan out the way it appears to be panning out i mean is he still investigating the reed case it's like is he because that's still Jesus. ongoing still, uh, he, he, he he remains on full active up. duty that's what this that's what i guess david procopio at the state police told uh told channel 25 tonight well i don't think that's gonna that can't possibly last <laughs> too long I mean, if they do an actual internal investigation what's the over so what's the over under on the day he 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 files to, for retirement. I'm going to guess Tuesday. That, what? He's only been on for less than 10 years. Oh, well, disability. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be much of a pension if you retired now, but, uh, well, it's funny because I, I was saying earlier, 
um, I don't know if I was told my dad this or someone else I was talking to before all this. I said, you know, I, I think that my dad, I said, I think that the best thing for Proctor to do is go in, have a conversation with the feds, tell them everything that happened in that house that night, tell him everything that he knows. And I guarantee he becomes a witness for the feds, uh, a witness for the defense. And you know, what will end up happening with all this shit. It all gets swept under the rug. They'll just tell him to resign. He'll get his fucking pension and he'll walk away. That's, and then, you know, that's, that's probably the cleanest way that he could get out of this, um, in, in my opinion. And that, you know, that shit does happen. That shit totally happens. And that probably would be the smartest thing for him to do. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's still looking pretty bad for all these people. And like we said, I mean, uh, the yarn has definitely been pulled out and is getting rocketed across to the other side of the room right now. Uh, you know, uh, he's got bigger fish to worry about. Oh, no pension right with only 10 years. Look at federal oh, there's no, there's no bigger fish to fry for the state police than a pension, Turtle Boy. You know that. That's true. Well, he, <laughs> that's true. But if I were him, I'd be worried about a lot more than just my pension. Right. Yeah. Well, listen, you got another, I, I don't want to hold you long. I know you got other stuff to do, do tonight. What, what's the, you are going into court tomorrow, correct? Yeah, that's correct. What, uh, and, uh, we'll see. They're going to try to revoke on some BS that I was at the courthouse at the last read hearing. And, uh, the person who made up a lie about, assault and battery and the charges were dropped uh they have an order on me and they showed up with jennifer mccabe as like a human shield for the first time i've never come to a case before ejected me from the courtroom i left i went where the officers told me to i told them about the the, the uh order being in place and now they're trying to say that i came within 100 yards it's a violation so they're trying to jam me up on that wow they, they don't give up do they then the corruption never ends then the, the corruption never ends so we'll see, but we have my lawyers. We're well prepared. We're gonna fight this, and uh, hopefully, it doesn't end up like last, like last time. And it's first, uh, it's first thing in the morning, right? Yeah, nine o'clock. That's right. Nine o'clock in Dedham. Dedham District. That's correct. Yeah. All right, uh, Turtle Boy. So. Con uh, you know, congratulations on your victory yesterday. And this is a, uh, you know, like you say, the uh, the the dominoes are starting to tumble now. Yes, yes, they are one after another. Hopefully, he starts ratting on his superiors. Yeah, that's why that was my that was be my final question, the old mob question: Will Proctor stand up? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if I were him, I'd say I would just say, "Oh, I told them all about it. I told them yeah. you all about it." That's what I would say. Like, the the answer to? the answer to that question, Turtle Boy, as you know, is always no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Nobody just takes the fall anymore. All right. Uh, Aiden Turtle Boy Kearney, congratulations and good luck tomorrow in court. All right. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks. All right. That was Howie. All right, my friends. Uh, so we'll go through a couple of segments tonight. I do have the videos queued up from Vinny on closing arguments the other night. If you didn't see the spot with Nick Rocco, we're going to play that. He did phenomenal. He crushed it. Nick, if you're watching, you crushed it, bro. So we'll go through a little bit of that. And then I want to get to Kirk uh, Nermy's. Uh, interview with Lauren Conlin <laughs> on her outliner outlier podcast. I do have video, so we'll be able to see it. But the thing that's curious about that is um, that was recorded eight days ago. So I want to see how their reaction was eight days ago compared to what we know now. Uh, and I think it's going to be really fascinating. So let's pull up Vinny first. We'll go through that closing arguments. Uh, I, I plan on being here for a little while tonight, so we'll just hang out and uh, watch this court TV. Here we go. Oh, it's loud. <laughs> I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And I'm going to begin this hour with this. The and it was funny. I actually um, tweeted at Lauren and Kirk today, and they said uh, approved. They, they thought it was great that I was going to review it. They said thank you. So, uh, Kirk, if you are watching, you ever want to come on the channel, uh, get back to me. Uh, let's talk live podcast at gmail.com, or you can just hit me up on Twitter and the DMS and maybe we can have you come on and, and do a spot here and talk a little Karen Reed on the LTL true crime. All right, let's play through this. Come on, Vinny. Let's go. Disclaimer. I need to do every time I do this story. I have no agenda. <laughs> My only agenda is the truth is finding out the truth about what happened to Boston police officer 
John O'Keefe. I haven't taken sides. I have an open mind. I need to see and hear all the evidence because this case is unlike any other case that I've covered in my career here at Court TV. Let's begin with the defendant. Karen Reed was uh, back in court today. It's Again, gone. on her Come way in. in, all the supporters are there. Um, she's accused of running over her police officer boyfriend on purpose and leaving him to die in the snow. She claims she is the victim of a police cover-up and frame job where they framed her for the murder after someone at the house she was dropping him off at had actually killed him in an after hours party after Karen and John had gone bar hopping that night. That's the setup of the story. So today in court, um, some important stuff was happening. Two defense motions were argued in court. A motion to dismiss the indictment. Um, this is huge because they're laying out a lot of the evidence as to why the indictment itself should go away and a jury should not even hear this case. Then there was a motion to disqualify and sanction the Norfolk District Attorney Michael Morrissey. Now the court has reserved ruling on both of these issues after the arguments today, but I will tell you, they are both long shots just because of the nature of them. It is rare that a judge will dismiss an indictment and it is rare that a judge will disqualify and sanction a district attorney. I want to say, did you notice yesterday um, Bev's demeanor in court? A little bit nicer. Gave Jackson the extra five minutes. Well, because she knows the feds are watching. The feds are watching. And just like Yanetti said uh, at the end of his uh, speech or testimony in court during the hearing, um, this is still an active federal investigation. Let's not forget that. That's what he said. This is still an active federal investigation. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I think Bev needs to just dismiss and move on here. And, and then let's really start looking after the people that did this to John. We just want to know what happened. What happened to John? That's it. We know what happened in the house now. It's been confirmed. Karen's SUV did not cause, the, cause those injuries to John O'Keefe. We just want to know what happened. Just let us know. All right, let's play here. But like I said in the beginning, this case is unlike any case I've covered in my career at Court TV. So let's start with that motion to dismiss. Um, we're talking about crucial evidence here that was discussed during this motion. Uh, and, and it begins with the Google search that was made by Jennifer McCabe. That's She's one of the people too. that is in the house um, that Karen Reese and John O'Keefe went into, okay? Um, also argued were, were evidence regarding John O'Keefe's actual cause of death. How did he die? You know, was he, was, is, was he run over by a car or was he beaten inside the home that Karen Reed says she dropped him off at? Um, so beginning with the Google search, the, the Google search is how long to die in the cold, Earth. right? And when you look and, and it says hose long because there it was misspelled in the google search itself but here you can see the protesters know they know what the big issue in this case is is that this alleged search was done hours before john o'keefe was found dead in the snow on the front lawn of this home so if the search is done at 2 30 in the morning then there's no way that karen reed could have committed the murder. It would have been someone inside. Why else would you search how long to die in the cold at that time of the early morning hours? So Alan Jackson, the attorney, big time attorney, right? Uh, flying in from LA, uh, representing- And I'll tell you, and I, you know, watching Jackson since all of these hearings and just watching how he's progressed in this case, yesterday absolutely on fire i mean full out action jackson uh i wish i could still sell these but i can't um but you know only a handful of one out so not to worry and i don't think jackson would care anyway but uh fully on display yesterday action jackson fully on display and the back of the shirt is badass. It has the, if it walks like a duck, it talks like a duck, it's a duck. And I have a big duck on the back of the shirt. It's a really badass shirt. 
Uh, a few of you did order them. A, a few of them did, did get them. So that's pretty cool. But anyway, uh, fully on fire yesterday. I mean, he was firing on all cylinders. And then having Yanetti basically mop the floor at the end was unbelievable. Really great display of two very, very talented uh, attorneys. And I don't want to discredit Melanie Little as uh, Melanie Little. I'm saying Melanie Little. Uh, Liz, uh, Liz Little, because she's been doing a phenomenal job as well, too. I said Melanie because her and I were talking earlier. All right, let's keep playing here. Uh, Karen Reed here. I made the argument today about that search. Take a listen. This is not in our, our papers, but obviously it's a complete and probably the most obvious distortion of the facts. The Commonwealth suppressed one of the most obvious pieces of exculpatory evidence in the entire case, and that was a piece of evidence that they know torpedoes their entire case and their theory of this case. And that's Jennifer McCabe's Google search at 2.27 a.m., how long to die in cold. They had the, her phone at the time of the grand jury. They had her complete extraction of that phone at the time of the grand jury. They had a celebrate <clears throat> report, Your Honor, at the time of the grand jury, and yet they did not present this evidence. They claim, oh, well, we didn't have the right version of the Celebrite uh, software. That's on them. That's not our fault. Certainly not Ms. Reed's fault. That's their fault. Get the right software. If you're going to bring this case, do it the right way. They say their, their argument is, well, we just didn't have the right software, so we didn't have the information. That's not true. They did have the information. It was sitting in her phone. They just didn't do their job and extract it. And should the Commonwealth once again stand up in some sort of def desperate pitch to dispute that time and this critical evidence, the court should note the following. Not only does the Celebrite report confirm the search and the time of that search, not only do our experts confirm the search and the time of that search, but now a Quantico-trained special agent with the FBI's Regional Computer Forensic Lab. In other words, the United States Federal Bureau of Investigation I wonder who she looked at at that point. I wonder if it was like her dad or or her parents. She turned and had a big smile. If you watch Karen, I wonder who she was. It was probably her parents. She looked back at someone on her side, and it was like, see, yep, it was like that body language. Like, see, I told you, I told you, you know. Let's play this. Not only does the Celebrite report <clears throat> confirm the search and the time of that search, not only do our experts confirm the search and the time of that search, right here. but now a Quantico trained special agent with the FBI's regional computer forensic lab. In other words, the United States Federal Bureau of Investigation also specifically confirms that that search oh, was made on Jennifer McCabe's phone and it was made on or before 227 and 40 seconds a.m. on January 29th, 2022. That made her very, very happy. She looks right at Bev when that concludes. And um, it, it must be a good feeling for her. It must be a good feeling. This is a victory for her. She can feel it. The victory is coming and the vindication is coming. That's what that was. You know, that's what that was there. It's such a great moment. She knows we we got it. We got it. <clears throat> that fact, Your Honor, is no longer open for debate. Compelling argument, right? And, Thank you, Kane. And you're using the FBI. The defense is using the FBI, unlike any case I've ever covered here. Now, you have to remember, at this point, there is a federal investigation of the in state investigators in this case. So the feds are looking at the state investigators, and that information has now been given to both sides. So that's a compelling argument. Well, it comes down to this, CK, as well. I mean, you know, it goes down to even just Coffendaffer. Coffendaffer is still going on and saying that, well, no, you know, because it's just something that the defense is saying. These are your people. These are your, this is your organization that you spent, what, 20 years with, probably longer. Your people on your side are even saying this did not happen. I mean, did you just hear that? A Quantico trained agent said this, it's confirmed. It did happen. And then the independent investigator that was hired by the FBI Someone that they strongly believe in with three PhDs to do a crime scene uh, reenactment and confirmed it did not happen from Karen's SUV. These are your people, Jen. They're telling you 
your own people and you're continuing to deny it. I I don't know. I think you're going to eat the largest uh po- the largest pie of crow. Is that the eating crow? A big old pie with a bunch of crows in it here pretty soon. <laughs> uh how how can you deny it <laughs> it was in front of the federal grand jury <clears throat> but now let's hear the the, the state the, the prosecutor's response to that regarding this google search wow all right so let me just uh pull this up so robin yes i do have plans to um cover more of the birchmore case uh it is something that i want to get uh more into i'm gonna have and i just have to reach out to her uh, I'm going to have, uh, I think her name is Mizzy. I'm going to have Mizzy on. I just got to line up a time and to do a show with it. Um, but I will uh, be doing more of that as well, too. And I got to get back to Brockton. There's been some updates in Brockton. It's just everything has been full for, you know, full here, Karen Reed. I think Brockton just had another hearing the other day on safety, safety in the schools. I got to get back to that. And Nicholas Rossi also had a court hearing that I'm trying to retrieve that hearing because it was recorded and he was back in court as well too. So again, many, many cases that I follow here, but once one kind of kicks up, we stick with it. And how can you not talk about this right now? I mean, it's going to be an absolute complete victory for Karen, her family, for John and for Karen's team. And, um, you know, you, you got to keep talking about this. It's super hot right now. All right, let's hear what Lunchbox Lally had to say. get to the uh, the Google search and I would agree with counsel in the sense that it's really no longer open for debate but I'm not really sure why we're still even talking about this or why this is still a topic uh, that they're pushing essentially what we have is yes what counsel mentions is there is one expert who was given two extractions presumably provided by defense counsel that indicates uh, from that particular FBI expert uh, that the searches were done at two something in the morning. What counsel neglects to sort of raise and and stress with the court is that there's a separate, uh, and I forget exactly what it stands for, but an RCFL uh, uh, analysis of the phone in which through both Axiom and through Celebrite, uh, and that conclusion of that expert is that the searches occurred when Ms. McCabe testified they occurred because the defendant asked her to conduct those searches at 623 and 624 in the morning. Really, the argument stops at the point of it's not we didn't do our job to get a cell. The cell bright version that shows that information did not exist at the time of the grand jury. So I'm I'm not really sure how the Commonwealth is supposed to run something through a cell bright version that isn't in existence at the time the grand jury is conducted. So you have a discrepancy. I think uh, Lally made a quote, too, during that. I don't know if they're going to play it, but I think he made a quote about how cell phones are very important. It's funny that you said that. Uh, lunchbox Lally. It, it's funny that you said that because wasn't it uh, two people that are supposed to be aligned with the uh, the Commonwealth were uh, told by the DA to destroy their phones? Uh, so if phones are so important, why would people be destroying uh, their phones? <laughs> now between experts and trying to figure out information from a phone when a search was made. So to me, this issue is still up in the air. It's way up in the air. Both sides are convinced of their side, but hey, you've got to convince us. You know, when I say us, I mean the jury ultimately. Now let's talk about the cause of death here. Um, Some of the images that we've seen of John O'Keefe's arm, we've seen some of the injuries on the arm. Uh, The defense is saying that these are consistent with a dog attacking him inside the house, a dog that has been sent away somewhere. there's also a video of Karen Reed driving the car. And did she make contact here? Sure is this how she damaged the back of her car? Or That's did she damage was. the back of the car when she uh, backed over and ran over John O'Keefe? Let's take a listen to the prosecutor now explaining the circumstances of John O'Keefe's death. There is no suggestion of a third party culprit, no suggestion of cover up of evidence, no suggestion uh, from the 13 civilians uh, witnesses testimony that we have received uh, or transcripts of that testimony. All of them confirm that Mr. O'Keefe never entered 34 Fairview Road. All of it uh, was absolutely no animosity between the individuals at the Waterfall Bar or at 34 Fairview Residence. There was no fight. There was no dog attack. There was no eyewitness to the circumstances that led to Mr. O'Keefe's death. 
Okay, so now the defense, they're going to use the federal investigation once again, and an FBI expert, take a listen. <laughs> Vinny's now, loving it. Hasn't... Look at Vinny's smile. He's loving it. Look at this. I got to go back a little bit. Fucking Vinny. I love Vinny. Listen, look at the smile. Watch the smile when he, before he goes into this segment. And an FBI expert, take a listen. Right there. <laughs> now Mr. Lally has in his possession another thing from the feds that we didn't have access to. Yeah. The federal investigators hired, independent of us, we had no idea, and independent of the Commonwealth, hired a professional reconstructionist, three PhDs, to look into exactly this, this issue. Did Karen Reed's car, did her SUV make contact with John O'Keefe? And their conclusion to a person was his injuries were inconsistent with the damage on the car. The, the damage on the car was inconsistent with having, been made, having made contact with John O'Keefe's body. In other words, the car didn't hit him and he wasn't hit by the car, period, full stop. That's their independent expert, not ours. Oof. Okay, <laughs> now, as you know, there's been this incredible groundswell of support for Karen their Reed. Their expert. It's really been... Commonwealth's expert. <laughs> the Commonwealth's expert. Led by this man. He's been on the show. There he is, the <clears throat> turtle boy and his turtle riders. Um, he's a blogger. He calls himself a journalist. He calls himself a YouTuber. However you want to define him, um, <laughs> he has sort of spearheaded um, this support for Karen Reed. But in the meantime, he's now been arrested and is facing charges for allegedly intimidating witnesses. Here he is uh, being released uh, in one of the times he got locked up. I mean, the story is, again, unlike any case trial I've covered in my history at Court TV. So I am fascinated by the support for Karen Reed. I, I understand, I think, from our discussions with Turtle Boy, um, where his support yeah. comes from. And, he he, you it, know, he's, a, he, he's covering the story and he was covering true crime stories and became convinced that Karen Reed was innocent. But how about the rest of those folks? The rest of those folks. Let me bring in our guest, special guest joining us tonight from Wilmington, Massachusetts. And I got to say, Nick, if you're watching, you killed it, bro. You smash this. Good job. Great job, by the way. Avid Karen Reed supporter, and apparently the man who funded the Karen Reed billboard truck, Nick Rocco, is with us tonight. Uh, Nick, thanks so much for joining us. How you doing, Benny? Thanks for having me on. Good. So, <laughs> so everyone knows there's a slight delay, so he's hearing me in a delay. So I'm just going to wait for uh, Nick's response. Nick so, Nick, it. do you have any connection to Turtle Boy? Do you have any connection to Karen Reed? No, other than getting involved in this case, um, I have no personal connection to any anyone involved. So what is it? Why? Why would you spend your own hard-earned money, because I know you work hard, um, for the billboards? Why would you spend the time to support an accused cop killer? Well, first, I do want to say that all these mobile billboards, the billboard that was put up in front of Gillette Stadium, uh, it did not come out of my pocket. We have a Facebook group that um, basically funds everything. Um, the signs that you see there as well, um, someone in the group makes them. Everyone makes their own signs. Um, we're definitely not paid to be there. Uh, a lot of us take work off to be there. And at this point, it's become a passion to a lot of people because the evidence that's being provided by the defense is backed up with receipts and um it almost seems like every time that something new uh groundbreaking is brought forward the commonwealth always decides to be like look over there you know oh look she kissed him or or this person's doing that and Tom. you know if you look at the facts of what's being presented to me um it's clear as day she is 100 percent innocent now nick there are thousands and thousands thousands of people i've I've interacted with online and have met at courthouses that are like court TV fans and true crime buffs, et cetera. And I know that they get connected to cases. 
Is this the first time you've been connected to a case, or has this always been something where you're talking about justice and looking at uh, what you believe to be injustices? No, I have not, I've never been involved in anything like this. Um, this is a very powerful movement say each and every person that you see at these protests and at these rallies um, truly believes that, you know, this could be them. And I think that's why you see so many people come out because, again, presented, how can you, how could you say she's guilty? Um, th there's, there's lots of lying going on, withholding evidence going on. Um, I've, I've, I've seen a few cases and, and I've never seen something like this. So, Nick, Casey, thank you for becoming a member, a rookie detective member. I appreciate the support. Thank you. If anybody wants to support and become a member, you can go down there below and click the join button. Uh, that'll help support the channel on a monthly basis. We're at about 199 likes. I'd like to get to 200. That would be great. So I just need one more person to smash that like button. And if you want to contribute uh, to supporting me, you can see all my links that Nightbot is dropping in there. And I also have my buy me a coffee link at the top of the chat that helps keep uh, the, the lights on here. Once I get the studio, I'm really going to need the lights to stay on. Uh, if anybody doesn't know, I've just signed a lease to a brand new uh, YouTube studio, and I will be getting in there hopefully uh, in a, about another week and a half, uh, but definite date will be on April 1st, and I will have to build out that studio, and um, my plans for it is to become... Uh, a fully module studio where we just kind of divide the room in half. I'll have a sing singular desk like I'm doing now, and then an area when I have live guests come in to actually sit. So uh, we have a lot of planning to do, and I already made the commitment. I will not turn on that camera until I feel that that podcast studio uh, or the YouTube studio is ready. I will not do it. So I will stream from this desk here until everything is fully up and functioning, uh, functioning, uh, I'm super excited. This is a big risk for me, but I knew that I had to elevate and bring LTL to another level um, and get it going because this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I don't want to work a corporate job anymore. I want to make this happen, uh, but it's going to take a lot of work and I'm nervous as hell. And this is the first time I've ever done anything like this to put it all out on the line and just go for it. Um, but I'm going to do it because this is my passion. I absolutely love doing YouTube. I absolutely love being with all of you. I love being out on the street and uh, reporting and having conversations with all of you. And this is something that I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, I feel that it is my calling. And uh, whatever this comes out of this, I just hope it's something great. I know it's going to be great. Um, but it's going to be a lot of fun too. And it's going to get me more in a very creative space where I can just go in. That is my office. That is my space to create. And I come home and I get away from it. And this is home. Uh, and I know that will help balance things in my life a little bit better. So super excited. It's costing me a lot of money to do it, but I don't care. It's well worth the investment and we're going to get this thing going. So anyway, we'll keep playing on here with Vinny from Court TV, Vinny and Nick. Let me ask you now. I can't Turtle wait. boy under indictment charges he's got to battle his own legal <laughs> battles while still supporting karen reed have you been charged with anything have you been questioned have you been confronted by law enforcement or prosecutors uh actually yes uh me and nine other people um and one of them at the time was a minor uh we're holding signs on a public sidewalk in in downtown canton uh across the street from a specific pizza shop um we just happen to be because it's it's the main road down there and uh we got summons to court for a magistrate hearing uh, witness intimidation on a police officer for not giving our names and then also picketing a witness uh, because we were apparently too close or within eyesight is what they told us of a witness at the time. Now, we did we did have this magistrate hearing back in January, and we were told that we would have an answer within a week, and we're going on um, two months now with no answer to if there was probable cause or not. Has this deterred you from showing up? Has it altered your behavior in any way?
I mean, my behavior was never bad to begin with. Um, it's not illegal to hold a sign. It's not illegal to, to speak what you want. Um, it has not stopped me from going to the, the court cases. Um, I would say I, I don't, I don't go to Canton anymore, um, because I feel like there may be a target on people's backs if they do protest there. Um, but other than that, I wouldn't say I, I have anything to worry about, um, because we're just there to support her realistically. All right, let's talk about, uh, the victim in all this, John O'Keefe, um, what message do you have for his family? I mean, they've lost this. John is gone forever. Officer John O'Keefe is gone. What message do you have for his family? Absolutely. Um, you know, through this whole thing, there. I'm sure you've seen it as well. There is there is two sides to this middle, and um, it, it almost seems like no matter what side you are on, uh, to the other person, you're going to be wrong. Um, I, I want to see justice for John O'Keefe. Um, obviously something very tragic happened, uh, inside that house. And like the FBI had said, you know, the recon reconstructionists had said that his damages do not match a vehicle striking him. And, and I mean, I don't know what else to say about that. Uh, I, I really hope one day, um, justice is going to come yeah, very just soon. Know. Um, just and, know and I, re I really do, uh, hope we can get there soon because it's getting, this case is turning very messy. Let me ask you, Nick. Is there anything, there's going to be a trial, all right? This thing is headed for the trial. Looks like it's going to happen in April. Is there anything that you, you could hear during the course of the trial, because we haven't heard all the evidence yet, that could change your mind about Karen Reed? Vinny, there's not much that we really haven't heard. Um, I feel like, yes, the Commonwealth has discovery, but you know, which officer was handling that evidence when it was put in. Uh, honest, the only way that I would ever uh, believe that Karen Reed did this is if they got the video camera footage uh, from across the street or from the ring camera footage that was potentially on 34 Fairview Road. Now, if you can provide cameras on that street, if you can provide the video evidence and show me that she did it, um, you know, not just finding uh, taillight on five separate undocumented visits, and just be like, "Oh yeah, we found it." Um, that that yeah. I don't I don't buy personally. But so the only thing that I would ever change my mind is yeah, if you showed video. me a video of Karen Reed uh, throwing the car in reverse at 24 miles per hour and striking John. But that video doesn't exist because that didn't happen. All right, final question, Nick. If I head up there in April when this trial happens. What's the scene going to be like outside the courthouse? Uh, what's the scene going to be like inside the courtroom? So uh, today, um, they, they, they limited the amount of people that could go inside. There was about 60 people that were allowed to go inside. Um, April, the weather's going to be nicer, Vinny. Uh, I mean, you see people out there on days like today or like frigid cold in February. You're going to see more people coming out in April, and considering it's going to be an everyday thing, you're going to have people out there. I can guarantee you all day until she walks in that courtroom, until she walks out of that courtroom, you're going to have people outside. Well, Nick, um, I appreciate you coming on tonight. This is a very unusual case. Um, I just have to correct one thing. You said it was frigid cold. I believe it oh, was boy. wicked cold. Right? <laughs> oh, dun, 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 dun. All right. Wicked, wicked cold. That's All right. right. Wicked, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I was waiting for that. All right. Nick, uh, appreciate it. Thanks so much. And perhaps if I'm up there, I will run into you because apparently you're going to be outside <laughs> the courthouse with it. the rest of the folks. Unbelievable. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, when we come back. Nick's loving it, though. Nick was Nick ate it up. That was great. Nick, you did a great job. If you're watching, you did a great job, dude. Uh, Scott with a three-month membership. Thank you so much, Scott. Scott says, uh, it's funny how... Now the Mass State uh, Colonel uh, Mon announces Proctor is under investigation. Laugh out loud. Fed's breathing down his neck much. The boogeyman are coming. Yes. It's, you know, listen, more, more of this is going to come out. You know that. It's, it's all starting to unravel, you know? And all the people that call this crazy, Scott. You know, think of all the people. That you, it's really what I want people to, to sit here and think about. 
Okay. Think about this for a second. All the people that you told about this case, okay, and, and what was going on and the corruption, think of all the people that one didn't uh didn't believe you or called you crazy. And now it's like you can sit back and kind of fold your arms and kind of bask in the sun a little bit here because when we weren't crazy, we were right. <laughs> we were right. And I was just saying earlier, and I don't know if you were in here, you know, I had uh, a couple of people that were literally calling me crazy, other YouTubers. I was crazy. Uh, and Turtle Boy's a, a piece of shit and all this other stuff. And look at us now, you know, look at us now. So good stuff. All right, let's keep playing through the rest of this segment and then we'll get to the podcast or YouTube video with uh, on Lauren Conlon's uh, Outlier podcast with Kirk Nurmi. And they're going to talk. And like I said, that was recorded about eight days ago. So it'd be fun to see what their reaction was back then uh, versus what we know now. All right, let's keep playing. It's time to hear from our think tank. Is there enough evidence for prosecutors? Is there enough evidence to prosecute someone else? Is it a stronger case against the police or Karen Reed? That's next. <laughs> Join Court TV's Vinnie Politan. In every story, in every trial, every case, there's at least two sides. In his own words, D.A. Morrissey revealed he has an interest in this case that goes beyond the interests of justice. He revealed that he knew that his office was being unfairly targeted and investigated. And it doesn't matter if his belief or knowledge was right or wrong. It's only important that he believes it. And this means he has a personal interest in getting Karen Reed convicted. If he can use whatever means he has at his disposal to convict her and he succeeds, he will vindicate him and harm the federal investigation of his office. On the other hand, if she's found not guilty, as we expect she will be, he knows that he and his office will remain in the crosshairs of the federal investigation. And it's important to note, Your Honor, both sides have been made aware multiple times that as uh, we have this hearing today. That federal investigation is still open. So there's a federal investigation of the investigators in this case, right? And the defense is using some of that information from that federal investigation, including uh, an accident reconstruction expert, um, someone who looked at the Google search. But let's 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 break through that for a second and just take a step back. This is the way I want you to look at this case, right? Because. The prosecution is making an allegation against Karen Reed. Oh, brown finger? Brown finger. Wasn't that bad at court yesterday. He toned it down a bit. Call him brown finger. Brown finger. But Karen Reed is making an allegation against all the people in that house. If you were a prosecutor and you had the choice of which case to bring to trial, which one would you take to trial? Would you go to trial against the people in the house? or against Karen Reed. Where is there more evidence in this case? I get it, it's a tough case to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Reasonable doubt is just raining all over the place. They can still win, but there's a lot of opportunity for that reasonable doubt. But look at it a different way, because they're saying, not only did she- If anybody doesn't know, this is what I'm talking about. They're probably, what are you talking about, brown finger? This is a brown, he has a brown finger. Why is this finger brown? Why is that finger brown? Look at, he's got a brown finger. His finger is brown. <laughs> oh, and I put this out on my uh, on my Facebook group and tweeted it out the other day. This is a brown finger. Why is he got a brown finger? Why is his finger brown? Look at that, it's brown. His finger is brown. Like, what's this wrong? Why is that brown? <laughs> what is going on there? What is that? But yeah, it's, it's a brown finger. <laughs> All right, let's go back to Vinny. <laughs> All right, real quick, I got a 10 from Suzanne. She said, I have been stalked and threatened. I have been doxxed, my family members harassed, and vile memes made of, of my recently deceased father. I ain't got no quit. Oh, I'm sorry that all of that happened to you, uh, Suzanne. Listen, I've had brutal stuff happen to me as well, you know? Um, they take it out on me. They say things to me on Twitter. They come in my chat. 
Uh, and look, you know, uh, we are right and stick with it. You know where the truth lies. It's all coming to uh, it's all coming to rest here pretty soon, and it's coming to light. So you've done a phenomenal job. I appreciate you always, you know, reposting my tweets and, and interacting with my tweets. You're very, very active on Twitter, and I appreciate you. And thank you uh, for the ten. Thank you for the ten. All right, let's keep playing. Did she not do it? We know who did it, and they're right in that house, and the evidence is there. So. Where's there more evidence? Let's bring in the think tank. Joining us tonight is Seattle, Washington, trial attorney, fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers, and Bremner, also with us in West Palm Beach, Florida, where it's always warm. Trial attorney, <laughs> former police lieutenant Rick King, and in Ooh. Cleveland, Ohio, retired judge, former. We got a fan. We got a fan. So Rosalind says guilty. She's a drunk. John told her to move out, and you can see on her face. She's a vindictive person. Ooh, let me ask you, Rosalind. Do you admit? Do you do you just ignore uh, everything that was said on the record yesterday in court? Do you ignore the fact that the Commonwealth, their expert that they hired? Okay, we we heard this yesterday that Jackson uh, Jackson said in court. And this is embarrassing. You know how embarrassing this is for the Commonwealth. Their own expert with two, uh, with three PhDs, uh, Quantico trained, literally after they did a complete reconstruction of uh, supposedly what happened, uh, Karen Reed supposedly hitting John O'Keefe with her SUV, uh, running him over and, and whatever they're saying, three-point turn, and it was up and down. It was 62 and 63, all that stuff. They that own expert that's with the Commonwealth said that he does not believe, or he said, actually, I'm sorry, he does not believe. He said on the record that there's no way that Karen Reed's SUV caused the injuries to John O'Keefe. Do you realize that uh the FBI have confirmed that Jen McCabe did Google Hoss Long to die in cold at 2:27 a.m. Do you know about the two phones that were destroyed and the DA telling uh, Higgins and Albert to destroy their phones? Do you know about that? I mean, did you listen to the court hearing yesterday? So, again, it's fine. Hang out in the chat. The chat would love to talk to you. All right, let's keep playing. Prosecutor and judicial fellow at the National Judicial College, Judge Gail Byers. Great to see everyone. Ann Bremner, you're a former prosecutor. Which case would you rather prosecute? The case against Karen uh, Reed or the case against the people in the house? Uh, I, I would say Karen Reed, hands down. Why? All the evidence points to her. And you think about, you know, who else has a motive in this case? You've got the physical evidence. I don't care about her supporters. I mean, some of those people in there, we've all seen that in trials where they can actually be more of a hindrance than a help to a defense, at least for me as a defense attorney. But I, I think that, you know, everything in this case, you might have a slick lawyer and right, everything right, else, yeah, but it'll yeah. point to her. Because here's the question, who else would have done this? Who else had a motive? You know, wh who else has evidence pointed at strong Karen Reed or the people from the house? Karen Reed. All right, Rick King, I, I won't ask you to be the prosecutor, but as a defense attorney, okay? As a defense attorney, who would you rather defend against charges, Karen Reed or the people in the house? <laughs> The 13 people in the house, because there's 13 people they got to put a case on. I mean, they got to pick every single person in there had to play a part somehow. And they have to figure out how, who did what, how they did it, and put a case on all of them. So for me, give me them 13 people every day. All right, Judge Gail Byers, uh, you've sat on the bench, but you've also been a prosecutor. Which, which case is stronger, right? Because... It's clear allegations going from one side to the other. By the way, her attorney, Alan Jackson, was an amazing prosecutor in Los Angeles. He prosecuted right. the guy with the funny hair, Phil Spector. <laughs> Phil Spector, the legendary <laughs> music producer. He won that case. Okay, so Judge, who would you, if you want, you know, you got two files in the office, which one are you grabbing to run down to the courtroom to begin the prosecution? Uh, let me tell you, it is, I think, monumentally difficult to try a case with 13 defendants. It is very difficult. Now, now, as a prosecutor, we all know, you know, usually you do a little bit of wheeling and dealing. So the first to squeal gets the deal. However, if you only have one person like Karen Reed, where there seems to be a mountain of evidence that points to this person in particular, there may be something that 
um, something to be said about prosecuting that case singularly, as opposed to dealing with 13 defendants on the other side where any number of things can go wrong or sideways. So I take Karen Reed all day long. Okay. So that's uh, looking at this, I think, from a perspective of, okay, where's there more evidence? Now let's talk about what's going to happen in April, which is a trial. And obviously trials, it's about burden of proof for the prosecution beyond any and all reasonable doubt. Um, what are your thoughts there, Ann Bremner? Is this case reigning reasonable doubt, like I said? I don't know if it's like showering, like reasonable doubt. It could be drizzling, like we have here in Seattle, or a little bit of rain. But, you know, the, the, I, I still come back to the fact that if, when you've got the evidence, you know, that, that, that she's got the motive, you know, that he's a cop, doesn't matter. You know, there's nobody else. It, it's not a case you can say that these other people did it definitively. I think that she's got problems in this case. And, and I, I just don't, I don't know how she, they get around the evidence in this case by pointing to other people, you know, especially. She listened to the same uh, testimony that we heard uh, Jackson and Yanetti talk about. I mean, I don't. Don't know here. Well, I think the, the key evidence that they, they rely upon is the, the tail light yeah. fragments, um, right. the DNA, the cocktail glass that was in the bumper, the tail light fragments that are on his body. Now, Rick King, um, I've listened to Turtle Boy, I've read papers, and it looks like I've listened to Alan Jackson. It seems like there would have to be <laughs> some planting of the evidence in this case. Right. So a jury would have to buy that, Rick. They'd have to buy that. Right. But the, the beauty of reasonable doubt for defense attorneys who have it so easy because they don't have the burden, Rick, no burden, <laughs> zero burden, right? But like to raise a reasonable doubt is just like, you know, that's like that's like lifting the, a, a tiny little dumbbell, right? A tiny little dumbbell is, is reasonable doubt, whereas you got to deadlift a whole bunch of the big plates to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt, Rick. So what are your thoughts? So I, when you talked about this initially, you talked about the FBI investigating the, the investigators in this case, and there's things that are coming out. Like, since when does the defense lawyer get to get to flaunt the FBI's, you know, results in a case? That's huge. And as that as that investigation develops, and you find out what was presented at that grand jury, well, they get to flaunt it, flaunt it when it's facts, and you put it on the record in a 50-page memo to the judge because it's true. It's facts. You know, th those are facts. Jackson just wasn't getting up there and shooting from the fucking hip. I mean, he's spitting facts. The FBI had a report that came out and said X, Y, Z, <laughs> you know? So when you get up and you can do that because you have the confidence and you have the backing of the reports from the FBI, it's fair game. Get up and say it. Stand up for your client. Defend your client. You have every right to do that in those motions hearings. Get it on the record. That's one thing I've 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 loved about this team. They haven't been afraid. Jackson hasn't backed down. Yanetti hasn't backed down. Little has not backed down. They've gotten everything out there. They've put it on the line. And they're just throwing it right back at the Commonwealth and just making them look like fools. I mean, yesterday was one of the most foolish, I, I think. Yesterday to me was the, the most foolish that Lally has looked to, to get up there. You, I mean, you have, you have, uh, what can I compare this to? You have essentially someone up there. Uh, how can I compare this with a, a, a college degree going against a three-year-old, you know, it was like Jackson with the college degree and Lally looked like a three-year-old. Uh, trying to come back in, in, uh, with his rebuttal. I mean, I, I think the, the second or third time that Lally got up there, he should have just walked away, <laughs> left court, uh, and almost like he didn't want to get back up there after he knew all this coming. I mean, the guy's body language is like, I don't want to be here. But you know Morsi's got his boot on the back of his neck, and he said, you are going to push. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised. I kind of feel bad for the poor bastard. I think in the end of this, uh, he's going to be the big fall guy. They're going to make him look like, you know, he lost the case. He's the one that, uh, you know, fucked all this up. Uh, all the, you know, all the stuff that gets out about everybody that was involved with this. It's all his fault. Seriously, he's going to be the one that goes down on all of this. And you can tell. I mean, he, his, 
his demeanor from the very beginning of what we've seen in those hearings to what they are now. Uh, maybe I should do a comparison on that. Pull some videos up of the very first hearings, his confidence uh, when he's talking at the uh, at the arraignment versus what he is now. It's completely different. Maybe I'll, I'll cue that up while we listen to this and we can see some of that. It'd be a great comparison. What evidence they have there, that can only help Karen Reed in this case, the way that it's coming out now. Now, that, that all may change and there may be some different evidence that comes out eventually that we, we don't know. Laundry, yeah. But as I sit here today, to know that as a defense lawyer, I get to to prom, you know to promptly put in front of the jury the uh, the the testimony of an FBI agent who is standing behind my theory of the case. I, I I'll take that all day. Judge Gail Byers, this this trial I, I think it's going to happen in April. It's it's it, you know Not unless happening. they win this motion to dismiss, which I doubt, or there's some unexpected delay. The judge wants to try this case. What are your thoughts about reasonable doubt? Um, for Karen Reed. So, Benny, first, I agree with you. I sincerely doubt the defense will win their motion to dismiss the indictment wholesale. And because the bar is so low for an indictment, which is probable cause, um, I think that is probably the strongest likelihood for why that indictment won't be, be dismissed. Because remember, you only have to, you know, show was crime committed. Is this likely the person that committed the crime? That's just to get the indictment. And as you said, once you get to a pettit jury or the jury that we are used to seeing in a jury trial, you've got a heavier lift. And I actually think that, yeah, there is an awful lot of reasonable doubt that keeps trickling out. And what's more, if I were the prosecution, I might begin to get a little bit concerned about jury taint. Well, this is a good one. Uh, so Rosalind says, Brian, uh, don't learn a lesson the hard way. Please remain neutral. If you take sides, it's a good way to lose subs and viewers. Viewers are both for and against Karen Reed. Well, I'll tell you this, Rosalind. I don't do this for clicks, views, and subs. I do this because it's a passion inside my heart. And if you've done anything here of watching my channel, this is how I've always been, and this is how I've always, how I've always remained on this channel. I choose what side I want to be on because you know why? This is my platform. And if you've watched the 120 videos that I've currently done on Karen Reed's case, I think it would become extremely clear to you what side that I'm on. I am 1,000%, and I'm going to make this very clear, 1,000% on Karen Reed's side. And If you don't like that, you don't have to watch. You can unsub and you can go find a channel that doesn't like Karen Reed. But I have every right to feel the way that I do because you know why? Karen Reed is factually innocent. And I please, I would hope that you could open your eyes and open your ears a little bit more because your side is falling fast. Okay, let's continue here. I think I just saw a quick super duper duper chat come through. Scott McGinnis with the 10. Thank you so much. Says, funny how now uh, M-A-A-G, uh, Andrew Campbell takes over Sandra Birchmore case and suddenly a Mass State Police Colonel Jack Ma leans, uh, leaks that Trooper Proctor is under investigation. The boogeyman are coming. D.A. Meatball Morsi. D.A. Meatball Morsi. Uh, let's go. What do we got? Nay with a two. Aussie. Thank you. Brian does Brian. Don't be messing with him. Thank you so much. Australia in the house watching tonight. Australia in the house watching tonight. All right, let's play. Or tainting the jury pool, given all of the um, media exposure that this case has gotten. Because remember, those same people that are standing outside Perhaps no one will ever, ever tell me what to do on my platform. No one will ever tell me what to do on my platform. If you don't like what I'm doing, start your own platform. But I will do what I want to do here. And the audience that comes here enjoys what I do. So that's why uh, I will continue to do what I do. Do what I do, what I do, what I do. It's my platform. So sorry. Nay says with the two Aussie says, oh my God, spell check. 
dissing, dissing. It's no problem. All right. Yeah, let's go. Some of the same people are they're connected in the same. Oh, time. by the way, I did queue up videos of Lally at the first arraignment versus what his uh, what he looks like in court yesterday. So it's going to be interesting. I, I love to see what his body language is. And then we'll get to the Kirk, Nurmi and Laura, uh, Lauren, or I'm going to get beat up on that one. Lauren Conlon's uh, interview. Now to some of the same people who are going to be picked to sit in his jury. And I think very few are going to be able to say they've not seen or heard or Ripping know something butts. about this case and that they are completely objective and have formulated no opinion whatsoever. And all you need is one yeah. person. More That's all I ever say. And I think that the defense is angling for that one person in these pretrial motions, and they are setting it up for the win before they ever do their opening statements. Like I said, it's so much easier for the defense, Rick. You just need one. You just need one. This, it's not like the prosecution. We need all 12. You just need one, and you say, yeah, we won the case. All right, think tank with us. They're not going anywhere. Up next. Scott Peterson, with the help of the L.A. Innocence Project, is once again trying to get... Uh, all right, sorry, I was on mute. Let's watch Lally. Lally first. This is the arraignment. Karen Reed's arraignment. This is back on, geez, two years, two years ago, February 2nd, 2023. Two. Let's watch a little bit of his body language there. Let's see how he's uh, he's talking. And then let's check out um, what he looks like now. This would be fun. All right, here we go. Permission, could I just pull the mask? Yes. Uh, yes. Let me have you wait on Stupid man. Uh, Your Honor, Adam Lally for the Commonwealth. Uh, the Commonwealth is requesting uh, that the court set a cash bail on this matter in the amount of fifty thousand uh, dollars, with uh, some additional conditions. Those conditions being the bail warnings, as just read uh, by Your Honor, to the defendant, uh, as well as uh, conditions that she stay away and have no contact with the uh, deceased victim's family, uh, that she stay away and have no contact with the deceased victim's residence, and that she be, be uh, prohibited from operating the motor vehicle during the pendency uh, of this case. Um, in support of that request, Your Honor, the Commonwealth would cite uh, the nature and circumstances of the offense as well right, as, I want to go to Lally. as the decedent want to... uh, and victim, Mr. John O'Keefe, uh, who was found in the snow at a residence on Fairview Road. Uh, at the time of the 911 call, there was uh, heavy snow and the temperature was in the team. Uh, no signs. Of I just want to, I'm going to keep skipping through because I want to hear him. There's no more volume. I don't know why I keep talking about this night after night after night. The volume is what the volume is. Sorry, don't know what to tell you. Turn your volume up. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I don't know why we keep battling with this night after night after night, uh, but it is what it is. All right, right, let's. I just want to hear him. Breath uh, and returns to his cruiser to retrieve uh, his AED device. Uh, this time, Canton Fire and EMS arrived on scene and took over uh, first aid. Paramedics then transported uh, the victim to the Good Samaritan Hospital in Brockton, where he was uh, determined to be deceased several hours later. Uh, several... Uh, Detectives from the Canton police arrived on scene moments after the 911 call. Uh, they uh, began to search uh, within the uh, uh, the victim and defendants uh, had been at CF McCarthy's uh, across the street before coming to the waterfall bar, as they stated. Uh, she stated that uh, the victim and defendant uh, appeared to be in a good mood, did not observe any arguing amongst the two, uh, described the atmosphere within the bar as friendly uh, amongst the patrons. Uh, she indicated as the bar began to close down, everyone was invited uh, back to that residence on Fairview Road. Uh, she observed uh, the defendant and the victim leave uh, the waterfall bar together as the group was exiting. So just to let everybody know, my, my let everybody know, my microphone is on 10. This microphone goes up to 100. So I, I literally cannot turn it down anymore. So I, I don't know what to tell everybody. It's It is what it is. It's just the microphone. That's the way the microphone is. I'm actually using a software in StreamYard that levels out your microphone. So I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, the victim texted uh, Miss McCabe uh, where to at 12:14 uh, a.m. Uh, she replied with the address on Fairview Road uh, at 12:18. Four minutes later, uh, the victim called her to ask uh, where specifically uh, the house was located on Fairview Road. Uh, while inside the residence, uh, she observed. When I get to my studio, I'm literally buying all brand new audio equipment with beautiful microphones and everything's going to sound nice. And there's going to be bass in our voice and it's going to be crystal clear. And you're going to hear the audio of the videos perfectly. Believe me, we're going to get all ironed out. 
uh, I'm spending a pretty penny to get this studio up and going and I'm going to get the best stuff. So uh, this is a $50 Amazon microphone. It's the best I can do right now. Uh, but I'm going to be buying a whole bunch of new stuff. So. <laughs> All right. So that was Lally from the um, uh, arraignment. Now let's hear a little bit of the modern day Lally when he gets up. All right, here we go. And thank you, Ron. No, I, I think 10 minutes should be fine. I just, uh, I know the court is... Uh taken uh, painstaking uh, detail to go through all the, the material that's submitted, so I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. Um, essentially, the defendant, as, as the court is aware, <clears throat> doesn't challenge uh, the grand jury presentation on the McCarthy grounds or a probable cause standard. Defendant motions challenges under Odell. Uh, Odell essentially states dismissal of an indictment on impairment of the grand jury proceedings requires proof of three elements, as the court is well aware. Uh, one, that the Commonwealth knowingly or recklessly presented false or deceptive evidence to the grand jury. Uh, secondly, that the evidence was presented for the purpose of obtaining an indictment. And three, that the evidence probably influenced the grand jury's decision to indict. None of which uh, I would submit. Stephanie, thank you so much for the 10. Thanks for the super chat. I appreciate it. Keep doing, what you, keep doing what you're doing. Karen deserved justice. Absolutely. A thousand, thousand percent. All right, let's keep playing. Uh, we'll the here. defendant has... Uh, met their burden uh, with reference to any of those three elements. Wow, look how gray he got. He is two years. His whole face is gray. Wow. He aged a lot. He aged a lot. Just addressing uh, sort of the overarching uh, themes of, of the defendant's motion. Uh, the defendant challenges, uh, as he just stated, the testimony of uh, Canton Police Sergeant Lank and his testimony attributing statements to the defendant that were made in the aftermath of Mr. O'Keefe's body being discovered in a purported deception of Sergeant Lank's uh, relationship with the Albert family. Uh, Trooper Proctor's uh, purported false and deceptive statements uh, throughout the course of his testimony and the Commonwealth's failure to uh, elicit a purported inconsistent statement of Christopher Albert and the Commonwealth's failure to impeach uh, Julie Albert's testimony. Your Honor, simply put, none of these uh, issues or, or stated malfeasance uh, actually uh, occurred before this grand jury. As it relates uh, to uh, Sergeant Lank, I mean, we're talking. Don't mess with me because I know where you live. I know where you live, Casey. <laughs> Don't mess with me. <laughs> I know where you live. Remember that. But anyway, I mean, look at Lally. He's just all aged out. The balding is getting worse. He's the sighing is more. I mean, he's just, he's, look how defeated this poor guy looks. He's just done. Get him out of, yes, you're in trouble. <laughs> uh, yes, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah, I mean, let's just play a little bit more and then we'll get to uh, Kirk Nurmi's video. About uh, what, what the defendant submits as an attachment is an incident from uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, so which doesn't right. involve anyone who was at the house at uh, 34 Fairview <clears throat> Road on the night uh, when Mr. O'Keefe died. Um, the statements that uh, Sergeant Lank uh, is attributing to the defendant were not only testified to uh, by Sergeant Lank, as, and they're testified not in a deceptive manner. They're testified to by Sergeant Lank in the sense of he indicated he spoke to I can't believe how gray he got. Holy shit. I got to try to hang on. A I want to see something. <clears throat> Let's go back. This year, let's go back. Let's go back, back. Two months ago. No, I want to go back further. Seven months ago. We go further, further back. Yeah, a little ASMR for everybody. We're going to go further. That's a year ago. I wish YouTube could just prioritize and put things like in order when you put a filter on. Nine months ago. I want to see him like a long time ago. He aged so much. 
three months ago. Can we just get to like a year ago? That'd be great. Five months ago. Bear with me a little bit here. Sorry, everybody. I'm trying to get to a hearing. I want to see Lally from like a year ago. Yeah, May 5th. That's what we're going to do. Karen Reed hearing, May 5th. Uh, nine months ago. Here we go. Wow. Oh, my God. It is. Wait till I show you guys. Wow. He has aged. Check this out. Look at this. He's not even like, look at his hair is all brown. His face is not full gray yet. Ms. McCabe caused in, in Ms. Reed's frantic uh, uh, search or trying to get to the residence on Fairview. Wow. The evidence demonstrates from Mr. O'Keefe's ring video that the defendant left Mr. O'Keefe's driveway at approximately 5 away in the morning from the ring camera. Uh, he, she does not arrive for approximately half. So this is back. May 24th. So it's May 24th. Now we'll go to the current day again. And we can compare. Wow. <laughs> Nine months. Holy Two officers shit. who had preceded his arrival. All of those officers also testified wow. before the grand jury. Um, all of those members who uh, received statements from the defendant uh, es essentially indicating that she did it, that doesn't just come from one source. That comes from at least five different witnesses, three of them paramedics with the Canton Fire Department. All right. That was a good comparison. All right. Let's get to the Kirk Nurmi stream with uh, Lauren Conlon from the Outlier podcast. I want to thank Lauren for allowing me to play these on my show. Uh, she's given me the okay to do that. So I appreciate that. And that was nice. Kirk actually tweeted at me today and said, thank you. So that was really nice too. And Kirk, if you're ever watching, you want to come on LTL, we'd love to have you over here. All right. They're going to have some pleasantries here. Uh, I'm just going to speed up a little bit. And I actually might just play this in uh, 125 just to kill a little bit of time here. All right, let's go. Um, but let's, let's get into Karen Reed. So I just want to know just right off the bat as a criminal defense attorney, what's your take right now? Boy, there's that. That's a big question. And a former former criminal defense former. attorney. I'm proud of that. I'm uh, I'm I'm much happier now that I'm not practicing. But let me let me say a, a few things, especially having been with so, someone who was involved in a high profile case, right? And a lot of what can happen, or what we see in the news, what we see in the media, isn't necessarily accurate to exactly what the evidence is going to be. Even if it's those things that people are talking about, reading and pleadings, what have you. There's probably 10 to 20 percent of it that's known to the public and a lot that isn't. So everything I say is kind of clouded by that by that reality. OK, yeah. the other thing I think is important to point out, we're here on, I think it's the 4th of March 2024. And there is another cloud over everything I'm going to say in the case in general, because we, we have a document dump of about 3000 plus pages of federal investigation that is taking on uh, the Canton Police Department. And so that the information in there could drastically alter everything that we're about to say as well. Mm -hmm. And the, and the public doesn't know about that. Right. And so there's a lot of uh, vehemency on both sides of the aisle saying whether she's innocent or guilty. And, and one of the things that the perspective I like to try to bring, uh, and, and maybe you got some of this when our conversation about Grant Solomon is the most objective one possible, the most dispassionate, if you will, because I think that's ultimately you know, how we achieve justice is looking at the realities before us and not not trying to please our passions one way or the other. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you. And I think today uh, the defense is supposed to file a motion uh, to dismiss or they're supposed to get it into the judge. Um, and I think a lot of us who paid attention to that hearing, we heard the prosecution say something along the lines of, and this is how I interpreted it, but something along the lines of, well, whatever the Fed said in this, you know, in these documents, 90% of it, it reflects our theory or is not new. That's what I took from that. And I was well, like, everybody keep in mind, this was recorded about a week ago. So it seems it's interesting to see what their theories and their thoughts are here or what his theories and thought is here versus what we all know now. And I, I'm sure that the, the, you know, the presentation would change a little bit knowing what we know now. <laughs> well, wait a minute. 
is she saying what I, I think she's saying and that, you know, that there, there is no investigation? His name is Kirk Nurmi, and he was actually Jody Arias's attorney. And now he's uh, a retired former uh, def uh, criminal defense attorney. And I think that was the really the last case that I think the big one that he did. Like with the feds. And then I'm like, no, can't be. That literally can't be, um, especially since something else came out about the Sandra Birchmore case. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But um, the Norfolk DA's office is no longer investigating that anymore. So, uh, you know, I think I think that's kind of telling as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the standard pat response of prosecutors when anything are looked into when defense makes discovery is, hey, there's nothing to see here. We'll hear the words. This is a fishing expedition. And, you know, to much my response is I want some fish and I know there's some fish there. And the idea the supposition put forward by the state that there's nothing to see here, that the feds just investigated for the heck of it. Yeah. And they really support our theory because they weren't investigating the case so much as they were investigating the police department, the prosecutors, et cetera. Right. So the idea that there's nothing to see here isn't one that resonates with me. Right. Right. And that same with me. And I think same with a lot of people. However, if you err on the side that she's a hundred percent guilty, these people were like, Told you. See, I told you. And I think that's what's so interesting about this. And I've said this before, but sometimes I think people on both sides don't read the responses, I guess, to, you know, to, from the other side, which can sort of cloud judgment as well. Nowadays. And I was guilty of that at first. I was like, well, you know, this document said this. And then I was like, well, wait a second. This says this. Now it's giving me something to think about. Right. Well, one one. And you're right. I mean, it, it's a bigger problem in society. We have a. a, a, a inclination these days to try to talk past each other, right? Uh, one of the things we have to understand, and I've certainly seen this um, on both sides of this case, really more certainly those that uh, support the, the... Yeah, I mean, people are just like picking that out. He was disbarred. It says uh, in 2016, Nurmi was disbarred on allegations of ethical breach for writing a book about the case. It wasn't like he did any crazy thing. And again, it was allegations. So I'm not going to get into all of that. I like listening to him when he's on court TV. Um, and I wanted to hear what what he had to say in this in this pod. So we'll we'll play on <clears throat> Commonwealth's belief or the theory that Karen Reed did this is they will read what I would call advocacy, fact based advocacy or, uh, you know, experts opining, what have you, and saying that that is verbatim. That is it. The Commonwealth, you know, cops are beyond reproach and this is what's going to happen. And, and that's why she did it. Right. Yeah. And there's others that will will take other data without any without any scrutiny upon it and say, OK, this shows that that she's absolutely not guilty. And so, yeah, I mean, I think you're right, because we, even when we say pleadings, I've seen so many people say that, that the pleadings are just this verbatim, unquestionable deal, particularly those proffered by the Commonwealth. And that's just not true. I mean, quite frankly, um, I consider that kind of un-American because we have a system in which you are innocent until proven guilty. And screw that means we automatically, the default position should be to impose scrutiny anytime the government is trying to take away someone's liberty. That's the social contract that we have engaged in as Americans. Yeah, totally, totally. And um, I think something else that's been incredibly confusing to me is the experts on both sides um, with, you know, the, the cell phone data. I'm, I'm baffled by this, why, how each side could have such conflicting statements or experts saying this search happened at 2 a.m. I mean, you know, I think one of the, the last filings had only touched upon, well, the, you know, our Celebrate uh, expert said this, this happened between six and seven, but they didn't actually address the 2 a.m. Um, search, right? They just said these definitively happened. Well, sure, maybe they did. Yes, they did. But I guess it was purposeful for them not to they mention know. the 2 a.m. Uh, search because they're not sure, or maybe it did happen. I don't know how you interpret that, but that's been very confusing. Well, I mean, there's a lot to say, but one of the other things that I think about when when I uh, when I think about this this data, like the Celebrite data, the, the the in terms of the searching, when I talk about the uh, Apple Watch slash phone data, it shows yeah. Mr. O'Keefe in the inside the house. Um, you know, Celebrite data is pretty straightforward. I mean, in terms of the time, what have you, it's work off Greenwich Mean Time. You have to adjust for time zones, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you're going to get a pretty precise uh, situation on that. Um, there, it's interesting with the cell phone data, too, because like I said, I want to hear the, the reasoning behind the expert's opinion. I want to hear them on the stand. I mean, that's why we have trials, right? We yeah. Trials in the courtroom, not by social media, not by <laughs> podcasts, not yeah. by any media, right? We have yeah. them in the courtroom. And part of what the assertions made by both sides in terms of location data being being one of the big ones i think and you know and and again the cell right data the state is saying hey no, or commonwealth nothing to see here you know to, you know what have you right which to me is intellectually dishonest because 
Jennifer McCabe, I believe that's the woman that, that made that search, right? Yes. If she was the suspect, <laughs> if she was the one fitting the narrative, those people that, that would automatically believe the Commonwealth would take this cell phone data, would take these cell bright searches as sacrosanct. If Karen yeah. Reed made yeah. that search, it would be indisputable evidence. Right. Yeah. But because- I it, love that he said that. I love that he said that. That Jen McCabe's gets basically hidden. And if it was Karen, <clears throat> if it was Karen Reed's, it would be full thrusted to the front of this case and it would be right there. It doesn't fit there. Now. Actually, they're trying to say that Karen uh, told Jen McCabe, uh, and that's the one that we hear about. Uh, in in the midst of everything that's going on, she turns to Jen and says, "Please, just Google how long to die in court. You know how long to die from hypothermia." Narrative. Then it becomes, uh, it becomes you know problematic. It's not so specific. I mean, I'm thinking about this case, and and how many times did the Commonwealth come forward and say somebody's guilty based on this same data that they're arguing now? lacks merit and i've seen it all the time in prosecutions and it's just like well we're the we're the authority we're the government whatever we say goes in a particular case and there's no intellectual honesty in those positions right right um now going back to what you said i i did interview jennifer coffin daffer earlier as well who really believes that karen is guilty and she said something to me you know that i did question at the time and it's funny that you're bringing this up because i it just reminded me that i i think i jotted down i need to question this but she said something like well you know, when you go into trial, you you go into your trial knowing that you pretty much have all of this evidence already. So you know what to expect. You pretty much already know the outcome. Um, and I have to find out exactly what you said. But I just remember thinking, well, that can't be true because the defense isn't. Yeah. Cases are always on being investigated as trials go on. Required to turn over all of, you know, their, I don't know what you want to call it, a smoke, smoking gun or whatever. They're, they're you know, they're big uh, pieces of evidence, right? So, um, for example, uh, somebody came forward and said they were asked to remove a taillight. And, um, but there was no chain of custody taken. I don't know if you have, had heard anything about this, um, but somebody um, spoke about this on a YouTube show on Friday night, I believe. And this was mentioned to the defense uh, previously, but there was nothing in the reports about it because uh, it, nothing was, was written down officially. So that was, that was one thing that I was like, wow, they really could be holding on to that. The other thing was um, the civilian witness that was mentioned um, on the last motion saying, well, According to John's cell phone data and a civilian witness, he was placed inside 34 Fairview. So I was like, whoa, you know, did somebody flip here? Did, and obviously, you know, a civilian, um, it's not Brian Higgins, right? It's not Brian Albert. It's not their, you know, their uh, police officers and, and ATF agents. So it must've been. Funny that she says Albert and Higgins, and then we know what happened with their phones. <laughs> it's not any of those two. Right. But it's funny. We don't we know what what they were told to do with their phones. And we know what happened at uh, what? 222, 222 a.m. before 227 a.m. <clears throat> Somebody attending the party, um, probably a female, if I had to guess. But these are just things that I'm thinking about. So it's like, no, I think a lot is going to come out at trial that we don't know about. Yeah, I mean, I tend to believe that, uh, you know, trial, depending yeah, on Yeah, from my understanding, Lally actually is a hell of a prosecutor from what I understand. And I, I may be wrong on that, but I think I even said uh, TB say that one time that he's supposed to be this hell of a, you know, this hell of a prosecutor. And uh, man, this, this poor guy is going to go down hard. <laughs> the discovery provisions of each state and whether they, like in Arizona, for example, you always got to interview a witness, what have you. Mm -hmm. And so maybe there's, there's some truth to what, what Jennifer was saying about, you, you kind of know what the witnesses are going to say, but it's not complete, okay. right? It's different because when people get in a courtroom and swear on the oath and sit in the witness stand with the judge and what have you, mm -hmm. it's different. Things take on a different tone and they might be asked different questions that they were not asked at the interview. New information could have arisen since they were interviewed. So yeah. there's always a element of surprise based on my experience i've done a ton of trials there's always an element of surprise in every trial in terms of what a witness is going to say how they might try to hedge what have you i think you know uh states experts uh you know they're going to they might change based on a, a particular theory a change in theory you know trying to explain the, the the cell phone data it might be a little different so yeah there's always that kind of element and then cross-examination of course that, that kind of can illuminate some of the inconsistencies that aren't apparent at this point in time. What do you think about the medical examiner's statements um, concluding at one point that she didn't think that these injuries were from a fight? 
Um, I, I believe that was one of the in one of the Within first James. documents that ever came out uh, on the Commonwealth side. They had the medical examiner say this. What has been your experience with medical examiners, and and are they usually accurate, and are they um, equipped to make this kind of statement? Well, I think in general, they're equipped to make this kind of statement, but whether or not it is accurate, I, I don't know. Like I say, I'm not going to take the government's version of events verbatim, right? And ultimately what we have here is, um, you know, and people don't want to acknowledge this. You know, I've heard a lot of advocacy about this saying, hey, this is the state's medical examiner. They're beyond reproach that, no, they are a police officer. They are an agent mm -hmm. of the government designed to con make conclusions that are consistent with the state's theory of the case. What's Dave, always no amusing, well, amusing is oh. not the right word, but yeah. oh, ironic to me that. is that a lot of people will, will hoist that uh, agenda onto defense witnesses, yet act like the witnesses for the state are somehow pristine angels floating around just trying to create justice. And yeah. that's not true. The narratives can change based on what the government and what prosecutors want, because they are part of the team. They have working relationships. They have, so it, it is not beyond something that should be questioned. And again, that's what we talk about trial. We talk about, you know, the other expert analysis, because the defense is obviously going to have an expert that says that these injuries are related to a physical altercation that happened in the house. At least that's the theory goes, right? Yep. So Pat, thanks for the 499. I appreciate it. Thanks for the support, buddy. I really do. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, if you're just coming in, we're watching the Kirk Nurmi interview on Laura. I'm, I don't know why I keep saying Laura. Lauren, I'm so sorry. And it's so easy because it's my mom's name too, and I should know this. Uh, Lauren Conlon's podcast. Uh, and this was recorded about eight days ago. And I think it's it's fun to go back and look, you know, what was their thoughts back then to what we know now. Uh, really, really good uh, spot so far. Really good stuff. And then, then once those theories, those dueling theories, are put before the, that's why they're the finder of fact. Yeah. That you know they go through cross examination. And the jury decides which one is more plausible, and or more specifically, if you know there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt as it relates to the conclusions that the state's medical examiner is making. Right now. I guess this is where it gets a little hairy for me. Um, if the defense is alleging a police government cover up, and let's say the police and the government, they have access to the body, they have access to the taillight, whatever, um, and and DNA is found on on this taillight of uh, John's DNA, let's say, how do you refute that as a defense attorney um, when you're Wow, that's crazy that they're talking about the DNA on the taillight. And we now know that because now we're seven, you know, seven days, eight days ahead of this, this stream, we now know that it's factually true that Karen, there's no way that Karen's SUV ever hit John. It's, it's crazy, you know, how they were, you know, how we were all, how they, everybody was talking, you know, seven, eight days ago. Uh, I found that really fascinating, knowing what we know now. It's crazy. Trying to say this is a cover up. This is a cover up. But I, I just feel like it, it is uh, the word cover up. And I deal with this with, you know, Grant Solomon as well. It, it feels like you could so easily be gaslit and you could so easily sound crazy like a conspiracy theorist. How do you uh, how do you deal with this in court and how do you navigate this, you know, your theory when it sounds so beyond, um, you know? Sure. I mean, first of all, I mean, I think it begins and it's kind of maybe a boring answer, but it begins with jury selection. It begins yeah. with having jurors that are going to be open minded and listen to it, because there's a lot of people that just want to believe cops, want to believe the state's theory, want to yeah. that sort of thing, right? They don't, you know, oftentimes you'll ask on voir dire when you're interviewing potential witnesses, you know, do you believe the cops always tell the truth? And most people say yes, right? And so that becomes, you know, problematic to the defense. So you've got to make sure that you have people that are open to listening to what you say. But also I think important is the idea, and the jury's obviously going to be instructed on this, is the defense doesn't have to prove anything. They just have to, cap, you know, show that the state doesn't, or the Commonwealth. I keep saying the state. The Commonwealth does oh, not have yeah. proof beyond a reasonable doubt that Miss Reed old. did it. And here's our theory. But they don't have to prove it. They have to put it out there. They have to put make it viable. They have to draw questions on that sort of thing. And really, from what we're seeing in the press, the theory is viable because my assessment of the case is it possible that it happened the way the Commonwealth said? Yes, absolutely, 100%. But is it also possible? that it happened the way the defense stated yes i believe that that is also possible and you know so you know this idea that they are doing a good job in the sense that they are putting reasonable doubt out into the out into the jury yes. panel 
Yeah. And I, I totally agree with that. Cause that's something I've been saying. And that's something I said to Jennifer, I just said, well, I, I don't see at this point who would convict her. You're telling me 12 jurors are going to convict her. Yeah. Um, when I, I do feel like there are so many holes and while Yanetti and Jackson have done a pretty great job of conveying to the public at this point, that there is a lot of reasonable doubt here. Um, and like I said, I still have so many questions. I really, really, I, I have a lot of questions. Um, but I still, you know, the, the biggest thing for me and I, what I really want to see um, come to light also is these, I think it's 31 pages of messages between John O'Keefe and Kevin Albert. And I don't think this is, and again, I came into this case a little bit late, so I don't know how much this has been spoken about, but you know, Kevin Albert is Colin Albert's uncle. Kevin Albert worked for the um, Canton Police Department. And it's been said that John was trying to uh, let them know that Colin was allegedly selling drugs, something like that. And that he was just trying to like be cool and say, hey, Kevin, I think this is going on, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I want to tell you about it. And there's, you know, there's a, a call between them. There's pages of text messages. I believe there's an email and I believe this was in discovery. So I'm wondering what was said between them and could that be additional motive um, for the Colin Albert theory? Right. And that, and that goes back to what we, I was saying before about not knowing a, a large percentage of the evidence, because you don't know the context of those text messages. We don't know the specific verbiage. Right. Mm -hmm. And was, and yeah. also in conjunction with that, with the assertions that you're talking about, the theory of, of drug selling and things like that, is that what got the feds to start the investigation? What got the feds started involved in this case and in this police department? So mm -hmm. there's lots of, of questions that, that give rise to that, right? And we yeah. also, we've heard, we talk about text messages, you know, there's originally a manslaughter charge, then she doesn't plead guilty to that. So suppose the text messages between Karen Reed and Mr. O'Keefe uh, are reason enough to increase the penalty, which, which to me only feeds the alternative theories and and one yeah. thing i think is important to say is when everybody shoots down these alternative theories but if there was really proof beyond a reasonable doubt there wouldn't be room for alternative theories right and but we see and you know we were talking this morning on court tv about the tragic death of madeline soto with at the hands of her her mother's boyfriend right there is not going to be room for alternative theories in that case because of the evidence and the investigation was so thorough when you have something like this the the, there is such a big lane for alternative theories. Yeah, and it's it's also the human behavior of <clears throat> so many people um, that were involved with this, or, or in my opinion, um, I really do feel like, and I, I had people just get so uh, up in arms about this, but I still, I, I really can't get over the fact that uh, the Alberts didn't come outside when there was so much noise outside and somebody's dead on their front lawn. I, I you know, a fellow officer, I really won't, I, I can't get over that. I really can't. I think that was one of the strangest things besides uh, Jennifer McCabe's 911 call that was so eerily calm, so eerily calm um, that it just, it sent shivers down my spine. I mean, she knew this man so well. I I just can't imagine being that calm, seeing my friend in such a state. Um, was, she, would, was she a police officer? No, Jennifer McCabe, okay. not, I mean, not that I know of. Um, yeah, not that I know of, but I mean that you know it's just that was her sister's house. Right. <laughs> that John, it's just it's crazy. Like it's it's that those things that that the people on the other side who firmly say Karen's guilty, what they argue back about Karen's human behavior. I'm just like I could say the same thing about so many things, you know. Right. Um, so Patrick says, who's going tonight to be the first to roll over now that we heard about the grand jury uh, yesterday? I mean, honestly, I mean, I. Listen, the, the heat is on Proctor right now. Uh, obviously, we saw the bomb that dropped on him today. Um, you know, I said probably the smart thing for him to do is just go in there and talk to the feds and say, hey, this is what I know. You know, and get him get himself out of whatever this is going to be a rollover on everybody else. Uh, I don't think he'll do that, but that would probably be the smart thing in his his case to do, uh, knowing you know, what came out in court yesterday about gifts, you know, give my wife a gift when this is all over. So I don't know. All right, we'll keep playing. But yeah, like you said, I think it's it's just going to obviously come down to the trial. But as somebody who defended a very high profile um, murder, murderess, murderer, I don't know how to, mm -hmm. yeah, whatever you want to say. Um, I mean, this is probably a weird question, but like if you <clears throat> were representing Karen Reed, I kind of think you might have an easier time with this trial than uh, Jody. Well, there's, you know, there's certainly no shade. Uh, sorry, against yeah. Jackson or Yanni, yeah. but I just, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. It's it's an apples and oranges type of situation. I think mm -hmm. um, to oh, make no, that comparison, and um, you know, 
I tend to be one, and this and this is no uh, commentary or derision on the, the. I mean, he could now knowing what came out in court, knowing about what he did with his phone, destroyed his phone. You know, he could. I think that's you know what the feds are doing, trying to put a, put pressure on everybody in that house to see maybe who is going to roll. You know, they know what's going on. They know what happened in there. But now this is all starting to get out and it's starting to become public. So now the the, the heat's coming down. They're, they're sweating, believe me. And now the feds are just sitting back going, all right, when's this all, you know, who's going to bust first? Who's going to roll? That's why they put all this out. That's why they put the heat out there. Defense attorney she has. I tend to be one that thinks that we should be trying cases in the courtroom, not necessarily uh, in the media, because yeah, that's where they're point. one and lost. They're not one and lost, like I said, in podcasts or what have you, so right? Sad. So, um, But at the same time, um, I think they are doing a, an excellent job. And like I said before, there is Big room for alternative theories here, and they are right to, and they and they have experts. You know, a lot of people say, oh, these, you know, the, the casting of a defense attorney is that they're the sleazeball trying to get somebody off, and really they're trying to protect the constitutional rights of the of the accused. And the things that they are putting into the media are not without support. They're not without expert support. They're not without factual foundation, what have you, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, yes, this this case is, like I say, it's riddled with reasonable doubt. Because earlier you talked about, I have so many questions. Well, those questions are called reasonable doubt. Yeah. And so for, you know, and so a lot of people, if Karen Reed doesn't get convicted, they're going to say, oh, it was the sleazy defense attorneys. They made all this stuff up. You're going to hear the, you know, people saying stuff like that, right? When in reality, that's our system. And right now, to me, it seems like the case that the Commonwealth is making is highly flawed. Mm -hmm. And it does, again, it's flawed nature in and of itself leads to what people might call conspiracy theories, because a lot of it, and, and we had the, we had the, uh, you know, the credibility, if you will. And I, I forget the exact issue, but there was, there was a police commissioner saying that a certain officer wasn't on the scene and there he was, you know, on the scene mentioned in the report. So yeah. credibility is lost. It, it gives rise to the idea that there could be a conspiracy. And, and listen, the, the more people involved, the less likely a conspiracy can maintain intact, but that doesn't right. mean, that doesn't mean that there wasn't a conspiracy. Yeah. And that's a big thing that, um, that people do say that who thinks she's guilty is like, you're telling me there would have to be 50 people involved in this conspiracy. Um, I don't, I don't know if you have to necessarily share everything um, with people uh, directly or indirectly involved with a quote unquote conspiracy. Um, only I just, I say that from my work on the Grant Solomon case uh, with some people in Gallatin. I don't necessarily think everybody's in on that. Um, you know, at, at the, the DA's office or at the, the Gallatin PD, I, I don't, I really don't. I think there are ways around it um, personally, but just the, the last thing that I want to ask you, um, do you, do you think at this point, jury selection, this has been kind of weighing on me. I, I really, I'm so concerned for the jury selection. I don't see how they are going to find anybody who has not heard about this case or who has not been swayed by the media. Well, you'd be surprised. And, and I say that because there are a lot of people, I guess, because, you know, you and I function in this world, right? You're doing mm -hmm. true crime podcasts. I'm on Court TV, what have you. It's hard to believe that there are people that know nothing about these things. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah. <laughs> One, one of the realities is, and having been there, you know, selecting a, a jury in high profile case, uh, even even with the, the second time around, um, there are people that don't know about these things, don't even pay locally? attention that are locally? even like, locally. Right. Yeah. Um, there are still people that don't know or don't because keep in mind, though, it's not just if you have no knowledge of the case, but if you form opinions about the case that are that, that can't be changed. Right. right so right. as a matter of fact. You, just using you as an example, if you were in the jury box, you might know a lot about this case. You, you have some information about it, what have you. Have you formed an opinion or would you be open to listening to the evidence presented? And your most likely response would be, you'd be open to listening to the evidence presented. I mean, honestly, that would be your response, not as a covert yes, uh, journalist. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, jury, honestly, but, that but, would be my response. And, and so there's a lot of people that are going to would be in that category, even if they know a little about the case, even if they've seen a blurb or two about that in the news. Mm -hmm. The quest isn't purity that you don't know anything about it, but that you haven't already formed an opinion. So if so, if you had, uh, you know, Jennifer Koffendoffer and Janine Driver on the on a jury panel, yeah. both of them would be struck because they've already formulated opinions. It seems that yes. that are kind of set in stone, if you will. That aren't you mm -hmm. would lean more towards this side, you would lean more towards that side, what have you. Whereas if I if you were on that same panel, 
I would pass you for cause because you're open to listening to both sides where the other two ladies would be gone based on their adherence to one side or the other. Yeah. And I, I am open to listening to both sides a hundred percent. And I, you know, I do try to ask other people, other sources, sources for information um, that do believe in, in her guilt so I can weigh everything. But I, I haven't been quiet about me leaning towards her innocence. And, um, and I think that, you know, that definitely up upsets people based on, you know, that, that say, oh, well, you're, you know, you should be, you shouldn't really, you should be indifferent if you're covering this. Well, I'm not investigating this. You know, I'm not, I'll be honest. Right. I'm, I'm reporting on this, let's say I'm observing on everything. And I, I have uh, stronger opinions based, you know, of her innocence than I do her guilt, but I still have questions. I still have questions. So I also don't know if, if I would be fair, you know, I, I don't know if I would necessarily want someone like me uh, and you didn't, you didn't know this. I'm not expecting you to have listened to yeah. like the last five podcasts I've done on this, but like, you know what I mean? Where it's like, I, I, I trust myself because I would <laughs> absolutely listen, but I also don't, I don't know if, you know, I've read turtle boy stuff. His stuff was very yeah. convincing. Some of his, his findings. I mean, I, I fact checked it. He hasn't necessarily been wrong on a lot of stuff. I don't agree with his intimidation of witnesses and, and that whole thing, but you know, he found lucky locker he found these witnesses that the cops didn't. And that's hard to ignore, you know? Yeah. I, and, and I was just using what you told me as an example that, that kind of fair and impartial jerk. And I'm, I'm laughing to myself because yeah. I wondered if we were going to make it through this whole podcast without mentioning oh. the now infamous turtle boy. Yeah. And uh, yeah. he is a, uh, poked his head out of his shell and he is here but uh yeah i mean i try yeah. not to but it's like he's part of it <laughs> yeah he, he is in, in, in a lot of ways and you know you think about his treatment to some extent i don't agree with the intimidation of witnesses i don't think you know it's wise to share information but he, he generally speaking has been right yes. uh more <laughs> often than, more often than not right so yeah. uh, and he brings and he brings the receipt so in that regard right there that you know and he's someone yeah. and the things he espouses is someone that there wouldn't be room for if this investigation was as solid as some people want you to believe, right? They believe it. They want to make the assertions. It's paid protesters that, mm -hmm. that he is. RB, thank you so much for becoming a YouTube member in the Rookie Detective. I appreciate it. If you are a member, uh, you can go down there on my homepage, slide all the way down and get all the members only content. I'm going to start making a commitment to try doing uh, either every other Thursday or just the last Thursday in the month. Uh, for all my members and start giving them some members only content. So uh, sorry, I'm not so talkative tonight. I'm pretty tired, but I appreciate everybody hanging out uh, tonight. I just wanted to kind of get through this video and uh, it's been very informative so far. I love Kirk's uh, stand on the case and um, you know, all the things that are surrounding in the case. So, um, Oh, excuse me. I got probably another 10 minutes or so and we'll wrap this one up kind of a quiet night. And then tomorrow night will be my first, throwback Thursday and you'll be able to come and watch a basically a premiere of when I had Sean uh, Sean from the Gulf on my stream it's going to be a replay over there on uh, tomorrow night at 7 p.m and you'll be able to come in and just do you know you can chat in the live chat um, if you haven't seen that you can come over or if you want to rewatch it you can do that I will not be doing it live it'll just be a premiere but it will have a chat and um, you might see some chats that get pulled up on the screen. That's from the previous episode, but you'll see a graphic on the screen, Throwback Thursday. And uh, I'm committed to doing those uh, every Thursday night to just keep some content going on the channel while I take a break, uh, some replay action. You can come over and hang out and watch all the replays. Uh, and then I will be back uh, Sunday morning. I have a little birthday wake up stream that I'm gonna do. My, my birthday is on Sunday. And then Sunday night, uh, I usually do a live show, but I'm going to do another repeat uh, of a premiere on that. And that will be the replay of when I joined uh, Turtle Boy and the Glare uh, on Turtle Boy's panel the other, uh, yesterday when we did the Karen Reed hearing. So you'll be able to come back and watch that on my channel if you'd like. All right, let's finish this up. I appreciate everybody being here. About 10 more minutes here. Being the Mr. Kearney's being paid, et cetera, without any evidence that yeah. I know of to to demonstrative of that. I heard uh, Jennifer Koffendorf on your show say, well, there was an ad for protesters. Well, anybody can put that ad up, right? I could put that ad up just, just to insert myself in and just to get people right. talking, right? It's right. just, you know, it, it's not evidence. It's not facts. It's just conjecture that somebody will use to uh, try to bolster their opinion as well. But, uh, to, you know, to get back to your question, I do think jury selection might take a while. It might take longer than normal, but I do think ultimately they will find people that don't have enough knowledge of the case where they have made a judgment and the trial to me this is one of uh the trials i've been 
looking forward to most because I know that there's so much, there's so much doubt. There's a lot of trials where well, I call them long form guilty pleas, where we saw him in Adam Montgomery, right? Uh, yeah. the, the murder of his, of his daughter. Um, it was obvious where that case was going. The evidence was there. Uh, you know, it, it would have been the same if he signed a guilty plea. That's why we used to call him long form guilty pleas. And, uh, you know, you know what the outcome is going to be. But with a case like Karen Reed, you. you really don't. And you really don't know all the evidence. And you're going to see, you know, medical examiners dueling it out. You're going to see cell phone experts dueling it out. And and you're going to all these officers. A lot of officers are going to face a lot of scrutiny. And of course, you know, I started off this podcast talking about that uh, DOJ investigation. And yep. um, that is going to impose uh, some interesting uh, evidence and uh, supposition into the into this trial. And the idea to me, as I sit here now, seeing what, knowing what we know, the idea that Miss Reed is going to be convicted of this crime seems nonsensical to me. It makes no yeah, sense. Yeah, because of all of the reasonable doubt. And do you, yeah. what do you think about him? Do you think a mistrial would be possible rather than not not guilty? It's possible. I mean, look, jury jurors and jury selection is such an important part of it because of of the mindset of the jurors. But one thing that no one can really ever account for that I, I I wish there was a way to study more is the group dynamics of a juror of a jury excuse me because yeah. you pick these you generally pick jurors as individuals for their mindset what have you and then when they get together whether it's six eight twelve whatever it is personalities can change and I've had cases I remember one case and you know the the, the four person stood oh, was the one who stayed behind and I could tell he awesome. swayed everyone else in his position because the other jurors. Jeez, I remember when I was 15. That was a long, long, long time ago. Long time ago. But that's awesome. Happy birthday, Kevin. That's great. 15. Left. Yeah, and he was the right. one who wanted to boast. And 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 there, there's been other jurors where I've jurors have come out and said, can we throw these people off the jury? They don't agree with us. This is dynamics of it all and the pressure and and the group think, right? And that kind of bullying mentality and all those things that, that come about. So we get um, there, Dave. You know, when we see, we see hung juries and and, and be, be for those some of those reasons because of the dynamics of it all and and then maybe somebody feels bullied and then they are entrenched yeah. in their position no matter what right so that's what makes it really difficult when you talk about predicting what a jury is going to do not only the individuals right. but how they interact together in a in a closed room and in in in, in a having an experience they probably never had before in their lives. I mean, if the jury room, the deliberation room, is anything like fucking Twitter. They're, it's going to take forever. This is never, gonna, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. Like these people are going to be like killing each other in the back. Um, okay. And, and I lied. Sorry. One more thing. Uh, okay. Let, let's say it's a mistrial. Let's say not guilty. We still, we still have John O'Keefe. We still have a man that died and we still have a family that's grieving. And if that was me, I would want justice. And now at this point, do you think there is enough um, evidence there to start charging the other parties uh, just to you know, turn the tables here and say, okay, well, what do we do now? I, you know, if she's not guilty, maybe, you know, they, I don't know. I, you know, I'm just thinking out loud here. Like how does his family get justice for him? You know, and, and I'm glad you, I'm glad you asked that question. Cause I think when we, when we talk about a case like this, that is so high profile and does bring so much um, competition, so much angst, uh, you know, yeah. uh, against each other, right. It almost becomes like a sporting event, right. It almost becomes team Commonwealth versus team Reed. And I don't yes. think it should be that way because in that kind of battle, you lose sight of Mr. O'Keefe and the tragedy of the loss of his life. And, you know, he was adopting, I think they were his cousins, right? His uh, niece and nephew, yeah. Niece and nephew, yeah. And so, you know, all those things get lost in this kind of battle, if you will. And, and that's a shame. Yeah. Uh, but to, to get to your question, you know, really, once the Commonwealth points the finger and, we, and, and whether it's confirmation bias, what have you, they have really pointed that finger. So you think about it, if Karen Reed is acquitted. Mm -hmm. which I think she will be. The question then becomes, okay, well, did somebody else do it? But if they were to say, okay, the new evidence of someone else's guilt would have to be overwhelming because right. you think about it. Let's say somebody else gets tabbed with this murder. Say, you know, John Smith, right? Mm -hmm. John Smith is tabbed with this killing. What's going to happen if John Smith is, is prosecuted? Well, you, I could, I, if I was John Smith's attorney, I would be calling every pro I would be moving to disqualify the prosecutor's office because yeah. they prosecuted Karen Reed, I'd say, well, you, you functioned under the supposition that Karen Reed did this, didn't you? I'd want those prosecutors as witnesses in my case yeah, right, right. and say, okay, yeah. you believe this, you believe that. Why did you believe this? Why did you believe that? And now you're coming after my guy because you weren't successful, right? And so um, in, in I don't the see- argument you're saying, right. like a very easy I, argument. Yeah, I don't see how a subsequent prosecution without overwhelming evidence 
And now could, it's been years be, and it's could be made. Yes. Yeah. And it obvious yes. they did not get, uh, they did not collect the evidence at, that they should have because they didn't treat it like it was a crime scene at the Albert household. Um, and now it's not their house and you know, the dog is not their dog and all these, these yeah. things. Um, okay. That's, that's pretty sucky. I would say for the, the fan, like that's, I would be pretty upset. I think, um, if I, we're John's family. Um, when it, it, it comes down to it, I guess if she, you know what I mean? I mean, I think that they believe that she is guilty. I do think that. And, and I think that, and I, listen, I actually do, sorry. I should, I, I don't actually know. I have heard that they think she's guilty or they, they definitely don't support her. They're not on her side during the hearings, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, I do think about them a lot. They've suffered a, a lot, uh, in their lives with, you know, John's sister passing away and her husband and, you know, John taking over as uh, guardians for his nieces and nephew, yeah. and now him, you know, it's just, it's, it's just not okay. So um, I do feel very sad for them. But. Yeah. And, and as, as we all should, and they are, they are another group of individuals that's getting lost in all this. Right. But, right. but, you know, and they, they may very well believe the Commonwealth's version of events. They have people that uh, are authority figures telling them that this is the case. And typically, um, you know, in my experience, one thing that happens is if a prosecutor loses a case or if a, uh, a cop is caught lying on the stand, first of all, nothing happens to him. But second of all, um, it's always the, the, those shysty defense attorneys, right? It's never yeah, our yeah. case, our case fail. And the best of prosecutors that I've beaten in trial on what they thought were lock stock cases would, would concede that I did a great job. And, you know, but mm -hmm. the worst of them would certainly just like, you know, it's a sleazy defense attorney. It's not my failure. It's it's his sleazy yeah. behavior. And um, yeah, and that's probably the line that will come out if the Commonwealth loses this case. I think you are right. I do. I do. Um, well, Kirk, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. As always, I will put all of your handles if people want to follow Kirk. He's at Nermi Unchained everywhere. So um... <laughs> all right, we're going to back out of that great little stream there. And uh, we'll just wrap this one up here. Uh, real quick, before I go, listen, I want to just bring some attention to a case that I followed back uh, for quite a while um, in September. It was a young lady named Chelsea Grimm that uh, left San Diego, was driving across the United States to come out to Connecticut to uh, meet up with her parents and go to a wedding. Well, Chelsea got out to about uh, Williams, Arizona, and then vanished, essentially just vanished uh, in thin air. And uh, Chelsea's still been missing since September of 2023. Um, I just want to bring some awareness to her case uh, if this gets out there. So it's a case that I still think about every single day, and I've done quite an extensive research. Uh, I went out and got all the um, body cam footage and case file, and we've gone through it. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I've had Steve Fisher from SF Investigates on my channel. He did a a very extensive investigation, boots on the ground investigation to go out and try to find uh, Chelsea because she was hired by the family. Uh, there was a lot of politics that were involved in it. And uh, the, the family hasn't been, has not been uh, cooperative at all. I mean, there's not been any, any new news stories or anything out there. I haven't heard anything new from her friends that I was in contact with. And it's just a shame. And uh, ultimately, you know, we've come to the determination that Chelsea is uh, somewhere out in Williams, Arizona. And the thing that I'm very sad about is that this young lady, if she is, uh, she, if she is dead uh, in the, the forest out in Williams, Arizona, that she does not deserve to be there. She deserves to be found. And there was uh, many extensive searches by the locals there and still have not come up with anything. Uh, it was just very weird circumstances and, and things that surrounded her disappearance. If anybody has any interest in finding about her case, you can go onto my homepage and look under the Chelsea Grimm uh, missing tab. And it will send you run you through all those streams. I think I did over 70 of them. And the last reported update that I had was from uh, Steve Fisher when he did his last boots on the ground search out in Williams, Arizona. And, um, you know, sadly, we've come to our decision that that Chelsea is probably missing somewhere out in that forest and didn't make it. Um, and why her family has not said anything uh, pisses me off. Uh, why her family has not come forward with any new information or talks about it pisses me off. Uh, it's such a sad case. But I want to leave this phone number here to the Coconino Sheriff's Office. If anybody has any information on Chelsea Grimm, please, please call 928 uh, 774 Four five two three, and 
my thoughts are with Chelsea every single day. Um, I know I don't stream about her anymore, but um, she's still in my mind and in my heart. And this poor young girl does not deserve uh, the ending uh, that, that, you know, we might've come to the conclusion that of what happened. So I do truly hope someday that she is found. And Chelsea, if you are watching this stream and you are in any type of trouble or you're just hiding out somewhere and had to get away, uh, email me, just email me. Let's talk live podcast at gmail.com. Uh, we want to know that you're safe. We want to know that you're safe. Um, but my friends, I'm going to end tonight's stream with that. I appreciate everybody being here. I know um, this was not a very talkative stream for me. I'm pretty tired. I've been tired. I've been working a lot and just a lot of things on my mind. Um, tomorrow night will be the replay. It will be the first throwback Thursday here on the LTL True Crime. You'll be able to come in, chat in the chat. You will see some old chats to get pulled up. Uh, but you won't be able to ask questions or anything. I won't be on panel. It's just a replay. Uh, I will be back on Sunday morning for a very brief Sunday morning live at about 9.30 a.m. Just do a quick little say hello on my birthday, and then I will take off and do my birthday adventures. I have many things planned for that day. Um, and then Sunday night will be the replay again. Uh, I usually do a live on Sunday, but I won't because I will have uh, plans uh, with a very special person in my life right now. Uh, and we're going to have some fun at dinner and, and some plans doing that. And um, Sunday night will be another replay, but I'll be replaying the stream that I was on with Turtle Boy and the Glare, uh, watching the uh, Karen Reed, recent Karen Reed hearing. So um, that's going to wrap this one up. I appreciate everybody being here on LTL. I appreciate all the continued support. And look, in about another month or so, uh, we're going to have a fully functional working studio. And hopefully I can have uh, some amazing guests in there. I'm super excited. Uh, I've run into a lot of great people in, that have come into my life over the last eight weeks or so and, and have made this happen, maybe pushed me a little bit. And the people that have been supporting me, uh, particularly this person right here, uh, that is a very special person in my life um, that has done a lot to support me and push me and fully believes in what I do. And uh, I'm very thankful that she's come into my life. So thank you. I tell you every single day, you know that. And um, we're going to make it happen. We're going to make it happen. We will do this. So, uh, all right, I'm going to get out of here. I'm probably going to yell that after the stream. <laughs> Don't yell at me, Casey. Uh, but we're going to, I'm going to go. And uh, I'll talk to everybody soon. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. I'm Brian. This is LTL True Crime. Thank you so much. I'll be back on Sunday morning for a brief live. If you want to come over and just hang out, we'll sing happy birthday. I don't know. I'm getting old. <laughs> uh, don't yell at me. <laughs> but uh, I love all of you. Thank you all so much for making me. Uh, making this happen it's it's been a ride and you know what everything that we've been saying all along in this case is true and i need to get back on some of my other cases that i follow and i promise i will and i want to get on sandra birchmore i'm going to reach out to mizzy and hopefully have her on this week uh i'm trying to get sean back over here i spoke with him through text via uh briefly i said sean you're going to come back on the show i know he's been busy he said i'll get back to you so hey we'll see what happens Tomorrow's a very important day, and I don't want everybody to forget this. Tomorrow's a very, very important day for uh, one Aiden Turtle Boy Carney. Please, please send him well wishes. I texted him this afternoon. I said, hey, uh, hey, man, good luck tomorrow. Uh, we are with you. We stand with you. Be strong. Keep your head up. Um, but it's a very big day for him tomorrow, and let's send some prayers his way that all this bullshit ends and, and it just needs to stop. Let him go. Let him do his job. Uh, he hasn't done anything wrong. And um, please send him some messages, post on his videos, whatever you need to do, tweet at him, whatever you do, send a new e email, send him some prayers uh, because we need him out here. We need him out here. And all of this frivolous charges that have been uh, brought up against him need to stop, need to stop. And man, he's been so right. 
He's been so right on everything. And, and this would not have all started if it wasn't for him. He is the leader of the free Karen Reed movement. He's peeled back all the onion layers and exposed everything. Exposed everything. And he's been 100% correct. So thank you, Turtle Boy. I appreciate it. And, um, you know, I appreciate you uh, letting me into the circle here and being part of the Free Karen Reed movement. And I appreciate all of you, all of you that have supported LTL. We're going to get this baby rocking. I'm telling you, we're going to get this rocking and we're going to get it rolling. And it's going to be bigger and better than ever. I think 2024 for LTL is going to be an amazing year so thank you all so much let's do this before on the way out throw out some turtles some hearts let them fucking fly in the chat uh as we roll out i'm gonna play the long outro tonight while well, the long intro outro that i use all right guys i'll see y'all soon thank you so much for supporting me i appreciate it good night said it feels we're the only ones fighting for the truth of what happened to john o'keefe and me and my family and my attorneys and my team have marshaled every resource to get to the truth. It just feels like no one else wants it. And Karen, just to be clear, you didn't do it. We know who did it, Steve. We know. And we know who spearheaded this cover-up. You all know. Yes, we do. And no, she didn't do it. No, she didn't do it. This is an innocent woman. She didn't do it. I tried to save his life. Yeah. I tried to save his life at six in the morning. I was covered in his blood. I was the only one trying to save his life. Why'd you admit to it? He didn't, she didn't admit to it. She didn't admit to anything close to that. Nothing close to that. And you should know that. I was like three or four times she said it to no, no, she didn't. that's not true. She asked a question. It makes absolutely no sense. That is the Commonwealth grasping at straws. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. We have the eight quack, quack. We've seen them. We've read them. We are using them. The genie cannot be put back in the bottle. Yeah, LTL true crime. We going deep in the dark. Yeah, yeah peeling back the layers, expose the hidden mark. Oh, yeah. From the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie. Get in into minds of the wicked, no alibi. LTL true crime unraveling the web of evil No stone left unturned, we diving to the prime Yeah, we digging up the dirt, bringing justice to the crime LTL true crime unveiling dark realities every time Yeah, LTL true crime, we going deep in the dark yeah. Peeling back the layers, exposed to him more from the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie Get it big to mind, something wicked, no alibi We gotta hit that, now we hit that, we hit that Play it through, we'll get that box I see how true crime go We gon' get hit in the shine, but then I'm not talking, baby, they got food Put the blue pants in your bones I know them two ain't gonna lie Put them two ain't gonna lie We gotta hit that, now we hit that, we hit that We gotta hit that, we hit that box I pick down true crime Blue down with dark realities every time